Good. Okay, so we've got another busy uh, session. This one is on disease and parasite management. Um, Glenn and I, and I have chatted. We'd like to, we're going to shorten this a teeny bit so we have more time for the wild and domestic sheep interaction section, which we think a lot of people are interested in. So we'll probably take a break around three and then start up just shortly after that. Okay, so I'll hand the mic back to Glenna and say thank you again for coming and sharing all this good info with us. All right. Uh, I forgot to say thanks to Jennifer for organizing this. She's done a really good job. Lunch was great. And it is a lot of work actually organizing these, so you did a really good job, so thank you. All right, so I get the feeling from chatting around that you guys are luckier than we are in terms of disease for the most part. It sounds like people aren't having huge disease issues and that probably lower stocking densities and smart people and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just sheer luck. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through here and, and we'll move quickly through parts where people aren't haven't had problems and spend some more time where you've got some questions. Um, so how many people here use dewormer regularly? No, as needed. As needed? Yeah, so a, a handful. Yeah. Diatomaceous earth as well. Perfect. Um, so sheep, o sheep and goats are much more prone to gastrointestinal parasitism, and we see a lot more problems with intestinal worms in sheep and goats than we do in other species. So, you know, horses have their issues, cows have their issues, but in it's really only in sheep and goats that we see significant mortality due to the gastrointestinal parasites. Um, in, the, uh, in BC, it is the number one cause of death in sheep and goats is gastrointestinal parasites, according to the samples we get into the lab, which is probably an underestimate because a lot of the private practitioners can diagnose that doing a necropsy on farm and they wouldn't send them into the lab. So it is, it is a significant burden. It's the highest, most significant cause of death in um, Europe and Australia and New Zealand. So, you know, we'll spend a bit of time on managing and how to monitor when do you need to use dewormer, what options are there that are non-chemicals for dewormer. So we're going to spend a bit of time on, on the worms. So... Who sees something? What's abnormal about this goat? Yeah, so there's a big swelling under the neck. Um, if you look close, you can see the eyelids look, the are pretty eyes pale. Look, the lips are sick. as white as paper. Um, so this is a goat with bottle jaw. So that's what happens when they get gastrointestinal worms. So this is his stomach. And all of these little red lines, they're about, about the size of a thread. Those are gastrointestinal worms called Haemonchus, um, which is also known as the barber pole worm because this is a worm who's designed basically to eat and make babies. Um, and it's called the barber pole worm because we have the gastrointestinal tract is red and it coils around with the uterus, which is the white part. And it can produce up to 10,000 eggs per day. Oh, um, and then we have this many worms. So we can see who we get pasture contamination super duper quickly. Um, and it's sort of like the death from a thousand paper cuts because the cause of death is blood loss because you know, each worm can't take much blood because they're quite small, but there are you know, 10,000 worms and so you wind up with blood loss. And that's why you get the pale eyelids and then you get swelling under the jaw because it's edema because they just don't have enough protein to hold the blood in the, or hold the fluid in the bloodstream. The swelling in the neck, is that advanced? Yeah, that's okay. You I really need to do something yeah, quickly. Yeah, I haven't seen yeah. that one before. Yeah. Um, so this is the most common cause of death. We actually had a really good year this year because it was so dry in the summer, um, and these worms do a lot better in high humidity environments. So when it gets so dry, because the the eggs are in the fecal balls, and those sort of get like a crusty outside that the worm can't get out of. Um, so we actually had a really good year this year, but prior to this year, it has been the most common cause of death. Um, in sheep, and we certainly see a significant number of cases in goats. Um, so in terms of life cycle, we're going to go through this one in some detail. Um, and the reason is that there's a lot of spots in this life cycle, and if we know the life cycle, we know how we can manage for this worm a little bit more. Um, so there, there are several species of worms. They all have similar life cycles. So I'm just going to go through homonchus, because um, that's the most clinically significant one, and it's very similar to all the others. Um, so we start out with... Uh, the sheep has the worms in the stomach. Um, those are passed in the feces, and they hatch into an L1 and an L2. 
Those are both within the feces. And then we hatch into an L3, which is a free living form that migrates out of the feces and up onto grass. Um, this whole thing takes about three to four weeks, which is why in your young labs, you typically don't see it until they're uh, a few weeks old. Um, this L3 stage is a free living stage. It climbs up the grass blades and that's where we have a lot of opportunities in terms of management because it's not a very hardy worm, so it's really susceptible to drying out. Um, so if we can you know, break up our feces, um, it'll dry out easily, whereas the other stages are much more resistant. It's not an athlete. It can really only climb up about three to five centimeters. So if we're overgrazing, we're going to have a lot more problems with this worm. Um, and it doesn't really like sunlight. It really likes moisture. So if we can... If we're putting our animals out onto pasture every day, if we can wait until the dew is off the grass, that's really going to help. And that's probably going to work here because the dew is off the grass quite I, I early. I say we don't get dark. We don't really get dark. Day. Yeah, exactly. I yeah. Don't remember seeing dew very often. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So you're, you're in luck. Um, or, you know, if it's a really rainy day, maybe if you're having problems with worms, maybe think about keeping the animals inside and feeding them hay that day. Um, or wait until the afternoon when it's warm and sunny or something like that. Um, so this L3 climbs up the grass and gets eaten by the sheep or the goat. In the rumen of basement, then molts into an L4 stage. And that L4 stage hangs out in the glands in the abomasum, which is the stomach of a sheep or goat. Um, and it can hang out there until, like, so if you, the sheep gets infected in the fall, it'll hang out there until winter, or until spring, um, when they go back on pasture. And how a worm... Hiding out in the glands of a stomach of a sheep knows when it's spring. I, no one knows. Yeah, it's a mystery. I yeah, no, it's pretty amazing, eh? I mean, they don't have brain either. Um, but somehow they know when it's spring. Um, and then they will turn into the adult and then produce eggs at, again, a rate of 5,000 to 10,000 eggs a day per worm. Um, all right. So in terms of the season, we tend to get a real spike. So... This is presuming a March, a mid-March or mid-March, early April lambing date, which is probably a bit earlier than you would do here. Um, so say you give birth April 1st, you get a huge spike in the number of eggs shed by the adult sheep, uh, the ewe. Um, so that means, so then we have another you know, three to four weeks until those are infective. And so then you get your pasture infectivity sort of peaking early to mid-June. And then you know, the lambs take it, and then you get their fecal egg count really starts to peak mid-July. Um, and so that's why if you're interested in assessing your parasite status, testing around mid-July tends to be best, because that's in your lambs, that's when you're going to be at its, at its worst. All right, so in terms of ways to diagnose if you have a problem with gastrointestinal worms, there are a few options. And... Like anything, when you have lots of different options, it means there's no like absolute best way. So it's sort of a combination approach typically is best. Um, so you can do fecal egg count, so those can be done. Any vet clinic will do those typically. Um, checking for diarrhea, looking for anemia, so to see if they're pale. Um, decreased weight gain can be kind of a hard thing, but if your sheep aren't doing well, that's sort of an indication, oh, maybe I should check their fecal egg count, check their eyes, see if they're anemic. Um, and then necropsy, hopefully you don't have to go to that, but sometimes you do. Um, so if you just want to get sort of an overall assessment of how your animals are doing in terms of gastrointestinal roundworms, um, typically pick representatives, ideally 10, depending on your flock size. If you've got less than 10, probably just do everybody. Um, if you've got more than 10, pick 10 labs and 10 ewes. Um, and then you can pool them to get an assessment of how your herd as a whole is doing, or you can run them individually to see sort of the spectrum. Because you know, there's always one in every crowd who has all the worms, pretty much. Um, typically, if you're going to send them in, so if you're going to bring them to a vet clinic, refrigerate them and analyze within seven days. Otherwise, those eggs will start to hatch. And then the solution used to look for the eggs will break down the larvae. How hard is that to do that at home? Super easy. Um, you just need a microscope. microscope. Yeah. Uh, do you have a microscope? Um, I you, get one. you work at a school. Yep, yeah. I do work at a school so I can get one easily because it makes sense. I'd like to learn how to do it. Yeah, it, it's easy to do. Um, I think we do some workshops sometimes on how to do them. 
Um, there's great resources online. Yeah. Um, and if you, like, you can just take a picture with your iPhone in a, micro- mm-hmm. in a microscope. And if you want to send the picture to me or probably to Mary as well, okay. if you're not sure, yeah. you know, is this an egg or is this pollen? Because that's the real crux is pollen can look quite like a, an egg. Um, so if you're not sure, yeah, just send a picture in and we can say, oh, no, you're looking at okay. pollen. Yeah. Um, or yeah, that's an I'd, egg. I'd like yeah. to learn. Yeah, it's not hard at all. If you don't make your own solution, it's not yeah, but you can do it with like a sugar, like a sheather solution isn't isn't too hard to make. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, ideally, you want to do a quantitative method. Um, so that's where you count like the number of eggs per gram. A lot of vet clinics, especially if they do small animal mostly, they'll do what's called a qualitative method, where it just gives you you know a one plus two plus three plus or four plus analysis rather than give you an actual number. Ideally, you want to do it at a quantitative method, but um, again, if that, you can't get that, you can't get that. Um, the quantitative method is quite easy to do on your own as well. You just need what's called a McMaster slide. You can actually get them from Amazon. Um, and it's, I think we just got one. Uh, it's like 30 bucks. It's not, not a big deal. Is that the one that's kind of gridded? Yeah, yeah, it's got the grid marks on it. And you better out like a two grams of feces. So I guess you need a scale, a microscope, and, and the McMaster slides. So not hard. Um, and that's something you know, the Yukon Ag Association might be able to help out with too if you're interested. Um, so in terms of our fecal egg count, um, this is all in the binder, but um, where we're trying to, the, we're having a lot of trouble with dewormer resistance and we're having problems with that throughout Canada and definitely in Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. Um, so trying to move to more of a treating only if absolutely necessary. Um, so if they're less than 200 eggs per gram, definitely don't need to treat. Um, between 200 and 500 eggs per gram, monitor. Um, mm-hmm. But over 500 grams, you need to think about whether you want to treat that animal with a dewormer. Um, and if there's over 800 eggs per gram, you need to treat that animal with a dewormer. There's just, that animal is not going to do well without it. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't non-chemical options that are have been any evidence that they're effective once you've got an infection level that high. Um, the limitations of the fecal egg count is that it can change very quickly. I mean, you've got 10,000 worms and they're producing 10,000 eggs a day. You can go from zero to 60 really quickly. Um, and also you can, can have life-threatening disease in lambs and ewes before they start, especially in the lambs, before those have worms have matured enough to start producing eggs. So you'll get a low count, but so you have to combine it with the other indications of disease. Um, so checking for diarrhea, there's something called the DAG score where you can look at um, you know, the amount of fecal smearing beneath the tail. Um, it is if you put them right on to pasture in the spring, they'll all get a little bit of diarrhea from the lush grass. Um, but it is a, a good indication and it is the most common cause of diarrhea. So you know, a good thing just to keep an eye out for when you're looking, looking at your animals. Um, the anemia scoring, there's something called the FAMPCHA score. Um, there's a copy in the binder as well online anywhere. Um, and basically it's sort of like paint swatches where you have these different color cards. And you just, because not all of us know what color a sheep's eyelid should be, especially if we're new to raising sheep and goats, how are you supposed to know what their eyelid color is supposed to be? Um, and you basically take this thing, this card, and you match it to their eyelids and go, oh, white, we have a huge problem, or oh no, it looks good in pink, we're all right. Um, so typically at a one or a two, you don't bother treating. A four or a five, you definitely treat. And around that three, you sort of a monitor and, and think about treating. Um, so times to monitor, and obviously your monitoring time is going to depend a lot on your management and how often you're handling your animals and how easy they are to handle. So if you're milking goats, you're going to be, you might you monitor every day. It's not hard to do. Um, whereas if you have a much more extensive range type operation, it's going to be a lot harder to monitor. Um, so in an ideal world, um, we would monitor about a month prior to lambing or kidding. Um, and that's a time to, th- if you've had problems the year before with worms, that's a time to seriously consider deworming everybody to try and prevent that egg rise right around the time of birth. And then that's, you know, because when you get that egg spike right around the time of birth, you get issues with pasture contamination and then lambs. If you haven't had a lot of problems, you maybe don't need to do that. Um, but if you've had problems a year before, that's a good time to think about treating. 
Um, midsummer again, that July, around mid-July is sort of when you get your fecal egg count. It's going to be right at its peak. Um, so that's a great time to monitor your lambs. Um, we do have a ton of resistance to our chemical dewormers. Um, so generally the recommendation is to do a fecal egg count two weeks after you deworm to make sure that you did what you think you did because we are having significant problems with resistance. Um, breeding animals in the fall is a good time to monitor, see how you're doing. Uh, and new introductions because a lot of ways you're going to bring resistant parasites onto your farm is by buying them in from another farm, especially if you're buying from Fraser Valley, um, Vancouver Island areas that are having Ontario areas that are having significant problems with dewormer resistance, you're going to run the risk of bringing in some resistant parasites. So deworming them before you get them onto your farm might be not a bad idea. Um, and then, of course, if you have thin sheep or they show signs of worms, um, another good time to monitor anyways. Um, so I've mentioned this a few times. We have a ton of dewormer resistance. Um, I have no idea exactly how much we have in BC. No one's done that study, and I'm assuming no one's done a study in Yukon. Um, but in Ontario, we've got 97% resistance to the ivermectins um, and 95% resistance to fenbendazole. Uh, we only have 6% resistance to levamisol, which sounds great, except that it's not available in Canada. Um, so again, rechecking a fecal egg count after you deworm is, is not a bad idea to make sure you've actually deformed successfully. So 97% of farms, when treated with the dewormer, their fecal egg count didn't reduce more than 95% is how they defined resistance. Yeah, so 97% of farms are having some issues with resistance. It doesn't mean the dewormer was completely ineffectual. It just means that it didn't drop the fecal egg count at least 95%. Yeah, or at least, so if you had a fecal egg count of 800 eggs per gram, it didn't go below 100 eggs per gram or whatever 95% of that is. So, yeah, definitely significant. Yeah. Yeah, there is, there's a topical ivermectin you can use. Yeah. Um, so ways we can minimize dewormer resistance um, is basically not using it unless we have to. So if you aren't having problems with worms, and it sounds like a lot of people are here, just deworming as you need to. If you're not having problems with worms and your animals are looking good, not deworming at all. Um, or minimizing your dewormer use and target deworming. So if you are able to, you know, if you have few animals and you're able to do fecal egg counts on everybody, just deworming those that need it. Because typically 10% of your sheep will have 80% of the worms on your farm. So there really is good opportunity to target deworm. Is that um, a genetic thing? About 20 to 30% of worm susceptibility is heritable. Um, the rest is a whole bunch of other factors that are poorly understood with you know, their immune system and exposure and nutrition status and all that stuff. But about 25 to 30 percent is hereditary. But, like, would that be someone you want to target for culling? Like, not let them breed anymore? Yeah, if you're having real problems with worms, not breeding the ones with the highest fecal egg count is. I mean, there's so many things that factor into sure. who you choose to breed, but that, yeah, that's definitely a consideration. And especially for your. Um, bucks and rams. Um, and then, of course, like any drug, using correct dosing and administering correctly. Um, other things you can do are to quarantine and deworm new introductions because especially here where you are probably buying animals in from areas with more worm problems than you have, deworming those before you bring them up. Um, and then if you're having worm problems, not grazing sheep and goats together because groats um, are a particular risk for dewormer resistance because they metabolize the drugs more quickly. Um, so you have to give a higher dose. So we don't have any dewormers in Canada that are labeled for goats. Um, That's the problem. There's nothing labeled so, for goats, yeah. Well, you get so many versions of how, you know, how to, the amounts the, per, per 100 pounds that you get. Um, yeah. Because it, no offense to the vets here, but... When I go online or I go and talk to a vet, they always give lower amounts that you're supposed to give. Uh, like it's a real controversy as to what is the right amount because of the metabolism is so different. Yeah, um, I think the typical recommendation is to double the sheep dose for the 
um, valvazin and fenbendazole. Um, and then one and a half times for the ivermectin. The nice thing about deworms is they're super safe. The so, ivermectin is super safe. It's hard to overdose. It's hard, it is. It is hard. You really have to work hard to overdose, yeah. which is, is nice. So it's sort of err on the side of too much. Yeah. Um, and then if people are rotating dewormers to do so slowly, like some people will do you know, one in the fall, one in the spring, then you're going to get multi-resistant worms. So you yeah. just rotate them slowly over one to two years. Um, so, since our dewormers aren't working very well, um, and because you know a lot of us are trying to minimize the amount of chemical pharmaceuticals we're using in our animals, um, there are a few things we can do to decrease our worm burden and try and prevent it from getting to a point where we need to treat. Um, so, rotating and resting of pastures is a great way to do it. Um, you guys are lucky here because you have quite low stocking densities, it sounds like. Um, quite a lot of land, which is not an advantage we have in the Fraser Valley. Um, also, if you rotate or keep them with uh, livestock, chickens, horses, those animals, you know, they'll clean up the pasture because they'll eat the L3 larvae. The L3 larvae can't affect a horse or a chicken, and so that larvae just will die in their stomach acid. Um, breaking up fecal pellets will expose those larvae to the sun and then they'll be killed. Um, so harrowing is a good way. Um, we also already talked about you know, maybe not grazing, you know, first thing in the morning when the dew's on the grass, which you don't have. Um, and, yes, and so, like, our rainy days as well. Um, and then, again, not, which is, is really hard and cheap, not overgrazing, because you can give them all the pasture in the world, and they're going to pick that one corner that they're just going to eat to the ground. Um, but as much as possible, not overgrazing, because those L3 larvae only climb three to five centimeters. So if you aren't overgrazing, you're going to have a lot more likelihood that the sheep's going to be eating above where the worms are. Or goat. Um, since you aren't doing do you, well, I guess you are using dewormers to some extent. Um, so it's kind of counterintuitive. So typically, would, I mean, what I would do anyways, if I was just thinking about it, I'd deworm my animal and I'd immediately move them into a, a safe pasture that doesn't have any worms. And that makes sense to me. But the problem is, is that, so we have our, our lamb here and our ewe, um, and this applies to goats as well. So we treat them, and if we immediately move them into a safe pasture, we're just moving that one resistant worm. And so over several seasons, we eventually are going to get an entirely resistant population. Other things we could try to do would be, uh, we're going to treat and then we're going to keep them on the same pasture. But their contamination is so high that eventually you're going to get to a level where it's causing problems for the lamb. Um, if we could just move from a contaminated pasture to a safe pasture, but then they're going to contaminate that pasture. So what's typically recommended is that you would treat, leave them on that pasture for three or five days, because then they pick up, you know, a couple more susceptible worms and then move them to your safe pasture. Because that way when you move them to their safe pasture, you get a mix of worm genetics. So just like you pay attention to your genetics with your breeding stock, um, you kind of need to pay attention to your genetics of your worms. Because the susceptible worms, in the absence of a dewormer pressure, they'll outcompete the resistant worms because resistance comes at an evolutionary cost. Um, so if you can get just a couple of those susceptible worms, then you'll get a mix of susceptible and resistant parasites on that pasture, and the susceptible worms will outcompete the resistant ones. And you can kind of try and keep that dewormer use a little bit longer. Um, so in terms of deworming products for, for chemical products, we'll go through organic options in a second. Um, there are three that are licensed in sheep. None are licensed in goats. Um, so we have the ivermectin class, which is ivermectin and noramectin. Um, then we have the Bendazol class, we have Valbazin, and then Panicure and Safeguard. Valbazin we can't give during pregnancy, but the rest are safe during pregnancy. Um, and then very recently we have a new one called Flucover, um, and it just came on the market, I believe, about a year ago. Um, and it's very expensive, it's Clocentel. Um, it's a very expensive drug, but very effective, and we're seeing minimal resistance. So it's sort of one to keep in your back pocket. Gold and cheap. It's not labeled for goats in Canada, but it no, is but labeled for goats be, in uh, Europe. Goats. It can, yeah. Okay. It's used for goats frequently in Europe as well, so we assume it's safe. That's 5%. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a significantly more expensive than the other ones. Yeah, I um, just use Ivermectin and Safeguard, and I alternate the two. Perfect, yeah. And if they're working for you, that's great. That's so far. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in the Fraser Valley, we've had 
a lot of flocks where they've been every two weeks they've given ivermectin and fenbendazole and they're still losing animals because they've got so much resistance. So that's where the flucover is really nice. Which one? I can't remember. Ivermectin or Safeguard is uh, not good for lact- when lactating. I can't remember which one. You have to wait so many days before you can save the milk again. Um, ivermectin, I believe. Is yeah, it, it's, it's written on the bottle. Yeah, um, I I'm pretty sure it's ivermectin. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of deworming, um, get away or do a, a birth tape, try and get an idea. If you, especially if you're new to sheep and goats, estimating their weights is not easy. Um, to try and get a vague idea of how heavy they are. And then dose for the heaviest in the group. Like we were saying earlier, is these are, drugs are quite safe. It's really difficult to overdose them. Um, so aim high if you're going to aim on one end or the other. Um, use a correct dose. Goats, of course, need more. Um, drench correctly. Has everyone know how to drench an animal. So with, with small numbers in your flock, you're probably just going to use a syringe and just put it in their mouth and squeeze. Um, some of the larger farms will use a, a drenching gun, which is basically sort of a, a backpack with a dewormer in it, and then you squirt it. Um, and those can be tricky because they can lose calibration, but I doubt anyone here is using that. The dewormer will be slightly more effective if there isn't as much feed in the rumen. Um, so Holding the sheep or goat off of feed for 12 to 24 hours before giving the dewormer will increase its efficacy. But in late gestation, you don't want to do that because you'll run into problems with pregnancy toxemia. Does it matter whether what feed uh, is it? And I don't know if I'm correct or not, but when I was checking it online, it said oats, keep them off feed, but alfalfa pellets, it's okay because it's a hybr- higher fiber. Am I wrong or does it matter? My understanding is it's just a matter of having stuff in the room and dilutes okay. out the dewormer a little bit. Yeah, is, is my understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, in terms of, the, we already went through sort of basic deworming protocol, and it sounds like no one here is having big issues. So you're not going to go on a full, if you're having issues with worms, you need to go on a deworming protocol. But it sounds like everyone here is sort of in that, we seem to be doing okay, just check in once in a while, make sure we're still doing okay. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any organic options for dewormers that have any scientific evidence of efficacy. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some out there that we just haven't tested. Um, but there, at the moment, there aren't any out there that are proven to be effective. If you are certified... Yeah. What about some grasses? I know when horses are checked for horse run wild, they'll be loaded with worms, and the move around, and next thing you know, they're starting to move. Yeah, there are some forages that are best. Um, so things with high tannins, um, and I believe sorghum is a good one. Um, a lot of the ones they've tested for sheep and goats are ones they've tested in the southern United States. Um, and right now we don't have too many ones that we've tested that are really useful in Canada. Um, but there are some forages that are better. I don't know, I don't know who's tested these, but um, the organic, the Canadian organic growers yeah. Yeah. I think I have a list that I wrote out of the cheat sheets. I can never remember these names. And heavy serum apparently is. Uh, I've had problems with bears in these already, but they get into the field and they dig up the roots. Who knows why they eat it, but they love it. Well, they've got to be eating it for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Do we eat French fries for a reason? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Sandpoint is definitely one, and I think it was Red Clover is another one. Um, I have it somewhere in here. Oh, yeah. Um... Birdfoot, trefoil, sula, and sandfoin um, have been tested and do decrease the fecal egg counts, as does Seracia less pedeza, which apparently is just a warm climate plant, but apparently it's quite effective. Um, tends to be ones with tannins in them. Um, there's also some great studies going on. They've got this fungus that 
If you give it to the sheep, the fungus will just pass through their gastrointestinal tract, and then it will bind up the eggs in the feces. Uh, so there's some good options that are being researched, but none that um, have been proven. And like with the plants, like the sandfoin, those will decrease your fecal egg counts. If you have an animal that's pale and has bottle jaw, it's not going to be sufficient once you've got a worm burden that's bad, but it, you know, there are a ton of things you can do to prevent your worm burden getting to that point. Um, if you are certified organic, is anyone here certified organic? No one is for animals. Great, good. Um, yeah, yeah, great. Um, so according to the Canadian Organic Manual, you can use chemical dewormers if you need to. If it's diagnosed, um, you have vet instructions, the withdrawal time is twice the label or 14 days, whatever's longer. Um, and you can only treat one time if they're less than 12 months or twice if they're over 12 months before they have to be sold as conventional. Um, so you still can use the dewormers if you have you know, a bottle jaw because there's really nothing else that's going to be effective. Um, so some of the organic dewormers they have tested, um, there's copper oxide, which will reduce humongous contortion infections. However, they've tested this in countries that tend to have a lot lower soil copper than we do. Um, so in Canada, it's typically not recommended because of the risk of copper toxicity. Um, because of our soil copper levels, we're already almost on the brink of copper toxicity. Um, and then you just add in that extra copper and you just really increase that risk. Um, diatomaceous earth, there's been several studies on that in both sheep and goats, and it has no effect on the fecal egg count. Um, same with garlic has also been tested with no effect. Any question on dewormers before we move on and deworming protocols? Good, excellent. Well, I, I yeah. It did, well, it would that would only be an issue if they were eating because it's you know they poop in the pasture where they eat, whereas if they're in their pen and they're just pooping on their bedding, they're not going to eat that bedding typically. You know, if you're free feeding hay and they're just standing on the hay that they're eating, that could be an issue. Um, but for the most part, it's a pasture problem. They're, they're quite, it's quite rare in feed. It's not nearly as much for like feedlot raised lamb. Where their feed near you know, their feed's elevated and they aren't eating directly off the ground. Any other questions about worms? We're good. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to disease. Um, so just disease. You know, every time you get, you know, probably right now in this room, there's several cold viruses circulating, and every time you get associated with a cold virus, you don't get a cold, which, thank God. Um, so disease is a combination of you know, problems with the environment, the agent, and the host. And so when we're looking at managing disease, it's sort of looking at all of these things and what we can do, you know, not just necessarily targeting the agent, but how can we increase our cheese persistence and, and make their immune system better. Um, so we're going to start at the beginning. So causes of abortion. Has anyone here had problems with abortion in their sheep and goats? Selenium. Selenium problems, yeah. That's a really common one. Um, so this is not because you can read it, um, but there are a lot of causes of abortion in sheep and goats. And all the ones that are marked in red are things that can cause disease in people, and sometimes they can cause pretty serious disease in people. Um, so it is good if you have sheep and goats that are aborting. And you know, one thing to try and get a diagnosis to make sure it's not something that can cause a problem in, in people or in your family. Um, and also to make sure that you are observing proper hygiene, so washing your hands, um, and that kind of thing. So, yeah. What, what really is critical in making that effort to save every man or, or kid that's born is not applying artificial respiration to newborn or stillborn lambs or kids. We had an outbreak of um, illness in people associated with this, with the height of the board goat. Um, importations occurred and they were worth so much money that people were trying to save everyone and abortion associated with Q fever or Coxiella uh, caused a number of families in Saskatchewan to get sick with Q fever as a result of trying to use artificial respiration. No mm -hmm. come out breathing for the baby to save the <coughs> uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. on the last slide, did it say kale? Not, yeah. I don't feed them kale anyways, but that's interesting. Yeah, it is, and it's not if they're associated with, you know, one leaf of kale is going to be fine. It's if they're fed more than 50. 30 to 50 percent of their diet is kale. Um, you run into problems with iodine deficiency, and also there's a toxin in kale that can cause some issues with abortion. Just abortion, thank you. In terms of the other health, I don't it, have that much kale to feed them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it can also cause a disease we'll talk about later called polio. It's a neuro, not like the polio people get, um, but it's a neurologic disease that's been associated with high feeding of high levels of kale and other brassica plants. Okay. Um, and they can get anemia as well because it'll break down some of the red blood cells. But you really don't run into issues until you're at that 50% of their diet. Um, which is weird. It's disgusting. It's so bitter. <laughs> is, that, is that also the family of, uh, like... Um, Broccoli. Yeah, broccoli, Brussels cabbage. sprouts, cabbage. Oh, okay. Cause all the things are good for you. They do, yeah. Um, it's okay. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not going to hurt them if you feed them. No, it no, no, it's a treat. It's not their main diet. Well, I, you can do great. Like, kale is a great, like, there, we've got one lady in the Fraser Valley who's feeding, she's feeding 30% kale and has no problems at all. So it's really once you exceed that 50% of the diet that, I, mean, I think if you're eating more than 50% kale, anyone would have problems. So. Your eyes go green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you develop superpowers, I don't know. All right, so I'm gonna go through the top three causes of abortion quite quickly, um, because there are things that we have a lot of problems with. And if you're buying animals up from BC, you could buy in as well. Um, so the first one is Clematophila bordis. Um, it causes enzootic abortion of ewes, so they can be infected any time during or before gestation. If they're infected before gestation, they'll abort in that gestation period. If they're infected during, they'll carry it and abort in the following year. Is this for sheep? Uh, sheep and goats, both. Um, typically, you get late-term abortions around the last two to three weeks of gestation, or you can get some stillbirths and weak lambs. And what you're looking at here is the placenta. Um, I don't know if many of you look at your placentas, but this part should be clear. You should be able to read a newspaper, and then you have these sort of big pink blobs. With Clamidophila abortus, you'll get this sort of leathery, uh, yellow-red appearance to your placenta. Um, so they usually only abort once, but then they're persistently infected, and they tend to shed bacteria around the time of ovulation. So a really good way of spreading this is to sharing a ram or sharing a buck, um, because if you have a ewe that's persistently infected, she sheds bacteria around the time of um, ovulation. That's when the ram is breeding her. The ram will then spread it on to someone who doesn't have an immunity to the other ewe. So um, not shedding, sharing your rams or bucks with someone whose animal health status you don't know is a good way to prevent this disease. Um, another important thing about this one is that it does cause life-threatening disease in pregnant women, and it's rare for the fetus to survive the infection. So... Um, being around aborting uh, sheep and goats is quite dangerous for pregnant women. Um, so to avoid the risk of effect infection, uh, the recommendations are that pregnant women don't help lamb uh, or milk ewes and does and avoid contact with aborted or newborn lambs or kids. Um, there have been a few cases where the, you know, they've done everything right, the husband has done the lambing and all that stuff and the milking, and then the wife does the laundry and then she gets sick from the coveralls. Um, but uh, one cycle on hot does, does fine to kill this bacteria. The um, second one that Mary was talking about, Coxiella burnetti. Um, so it causes late-term abortions. You can get abortion storms affecting more than 50% of your animals, um, typically in your younger stock. Um, it is a reportable disease. It's up to the lab to report it to your veterinarian. Um, I assume it's reportable here, too. It will be. It will be reportable here. Um, so when people... Oops, I moved too fast. Um, in people, this causes a disease called Q fever. Um, it's especially dangerous to people who are immunosuppressed, especially people who have like heart valve replacements. Um, and it's also very dangerous to pregnant women as well. Um, in most of us, it doesn't really cause... Actually, I'll talk about this in a second. Oops, no, I don't. In most of us, it doesn't cause serious disease. Um, you know, odds are someone in this room is positive, but it's really in pregnant women and immunosuppressed people. It's a problem. Um, they are exposed by inhaling or ingesting uh, placenta tissue or uterine discharge. 
Um, so moving your animals, if an animal has aborted, moving them somewhere else is a great way to prevent transmission. Um, it also can be shed in feces and in milk. Um, so it looks, this is exactly the same picture from the last slide, I just turned it over. Um, it causes the exact same lesions as Chlamydophila aborta. So you have these cotyledons and this leathery look in between the cotyledons. So if you have a placenta and you can't read your newspaper through it, that's a really good placenta to get to Mary to have a look at. Um, it also can often only be diagnosed from the placenta. So if you have an abortion problem and you want to pursue a diagnosis, if you can send the placenta in, that really, really helps. I mean, I know sometimes the dog eats it. It's not always possible. Um, but if as much as possible, if you can send in the placenta, that really helps you get a diagnosis. Um, all right, so in BC, we've only had eight cases of Q fever between 1993 and 2009. I don't, have you had any in the Yukon that you know of? Excellent. Um, and that's despite the fact that 61% of BC's dairy farms are positive for Q, the bacteria that causes Q fever. Um, in Ontario, 67% of farm workers were, have been exposed. So exposure is significantly more common than disease. So Toxoplasma gondii is sort of the pepperoni pizza cause of abortion. So you get, so this is sort of what the normal placenta should look like. You can read through, it's really clear and shiny. But then these cotyledons, they look like pepperoni. They've got all these white yellow spots on them. And that's a sign of Toxoplasma. Um, so have you guys heard the recommendation that pregnant women don't clean cat litter boxes? That's for this disease. Um, so the normal life cycle is that, um, the cat sheds the, the eggs of the parasite in the feces. The rat gets infected and those parasites migrate to its brain or they change its behavior and they cause risk-taking behavior in the rat. And that risk-taking behavior makes it more likely that that rat is gonna be eaten by a cat. And it just continues this life cycle. Where we have problems is if a human or a pregnant goat or sheep um, gets into contact with the cat feces that have the infected oocyst, then we can also have abortions resulting from that. Um, interestingly, in people, they've also found that there has been an association between people who are infected, which is a significant portion of the population, so at least a quarter of the population. Um, and it's been associated with you know, people who, wear, who have been exposed or show signs of exposure. They wear more brightly colored clothing. They're more likely to get into a car accident, higher rates of prison. It's interesting. It's creepy. <laughs> I know, he looks mad. <laughs> He's probably been infected. <laughs> um, so in terms of if you have an abortion uh, and you want to figure out what it is, um, the next step would be to submit it to Mary. Odds are good you'll get a report back. 70% of the time your report back will be cause of abortion undetermined, um, which is very frustrating for everybody because we don't like not getting answers. But... It does mean that a lot of the important and infectious causes of abortion will have been ruled out. So, they'll, so she'll have ruled out Chlamydophila, Coxiella, Toxoplasma, you know, and some of the other infectious causes. A lot of the nutrition causes can be ruled out. Most of these abortions that we don't get a diagnosis with, we think are probably due to maternal factors. <coughs> so sheep and goats will abort fairly readily. So if they get stressed out, if there's social stress, if they get sick, They'll abort and there'll be no sign in the fetus of why that happened. Um, so it is still worthwhile figuring out the cause of abortion. Even if every time you get a report back saying nothing was found, it means that there wasn't anything important that caused that abortion. That would have significance for your flock or herd. Um, when to submit? I mean, if you've got this vet program, that you can submit all the time. That's amazing. Um, typically, we recommend submitting if you've lost more than 2% of your... Um, calves or lambs, but if you only have eight, that's like one. Um, so it is up to you and how curious you are. If you're newer, I'd urge you to submit sooner just because there, there might be things you don't know and you're, you know, you're new to this. So you might be able to learn from that. Um, a lot of times we recommend that people put the fetus and the placenta in the freezer if you've had one abortion, and then if you have another one, send them in at the same time because you'll be more likely to get like a full picture of what's going on. Or you can always call and ask and say, is it going to be worthwhile for me to submit this? I don't know. All right. Any questions about abortions before we move on? Yeah. I know in Cavalier, 
Yeah, like a foothill abortion? Um, I don't know that it causes abortion in sheep and goats. Anyone else know? Pine needles? I don't know. Goats love them. Yeah, I haven't heard of any cases of abortion with pine in, in sheep and goats. But I'm not sure. I can get back to you. All right. Um, so lambs and kids. So let me just see how I'm doing for time. Ah, we're good. Um, so the most vulnerable time in, in any animal's life it tends to be in the early neonatal period. Um, so in the first 24 hours, we're going to want to keep them clean and dry. Um, we want to have appropriate space between our lambs and our kids um, and clean between the batches because pathogens tend to accumulate over the season. Um, we want to keep them warm as much as possible. Um, are people dipping navels generally? Iodine. Iodine, yeah. Um, so that's to prevent E. coli is everywhere in the environment. It's in the feces. And um, dipping with iodine will decrease the risk of that E. coli entering and causing navel ill. Um, generally, they rec- they're... Studies that have compared spraying and dipping with iodine show dipping to be more effective. I think because you get a more thorough coating. If you're really thorough on spraying, that's great too. Um, Is anyone managing their own colostrum bottle feeding at all? I sometimes Sometimes. do um, because I get four kids and I take two of them off. Yeah. Because otherwise you get too many ones. Yeah. Does everyone know what colostrum is, actually? So yeah, it's your first 24 hours um, feeding. Yeah, so yeah, it's the first milk, um, and it has the antibodies that they need for protection. Um, so if you get an animal that doesn't have enough protection, they're just a sitting duck for every infection that goes by. Um, so generally, if you are lambing or kidding, it's not a bad idea to have some colostrum on hand. So either from a local, I don't know if you have local dairies here, but... Well, what I do with my first one is I'll take some and I'll freeze it. Yeah, yeah. So taking some from another and freezing it is great. Um, you can get packaged powder colostrum yeah, as well. That does a great job. But it doesn't have a lot of the antibodies. It's typically a dairy cow product, so it won't have uh, ORF protection or clostridial protection um, or getting it from a local dairy, but it's still much better than nothing, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Ah, good to know. Thanks. Yeah. No, I don't either. That if you're having problems with uh, CAE, Yoni's disease, or mycoplasma. Um, Absolutely, yeah. A lot of people who are on uh, a CAE or a Yoni's eradication protocol, they're pulling the lambs or kids directly like before they hit the ground and then feeding them, and that's when you need to heat treat um, to get rid of those pathogens. Um, so not surprisingly, organisms do tend to build up during the kidding season, and you can spread them from animal to animal. Um, so avoid other ways to keep them healthy is to avoid environmental stress, avoid crowding, uh, moisture, pure ventilation, um, and not allowing fecal contamination of feed water or milk as much as possible. Um, and packing crates or dog kennels are a great option if you're having an outbreak of something. Um, conveniently for diarrhea, sheep and goats tend to have very age-specific problems with them. Um, so... From six hours to five days of age, it's usually an E. coli diarrhea, so an antibiotic might be effective. Um, From three days to ten days of age, um, it's typically something called cryptosporidia, which is important to know about because it can cause disease in people. Um, And then two weeks to 20 weeks, it's typically a coccidiosis, which we'll talk about in a second. Basically, if it is a neonatal diarrhea, it's basically the same approach you have for your children. You keep them warm and dry. And then supportive care, because what causes death of the diarrhea is dehydration. So anything you can do to prevent that dehydration. Um, 
So I don't know if many of you have these electrolyte products around. Yeah. I do, but I'm, I'm always told that, yes, deal with it because you don't want to dehydrate, but you got to find the underlying cause of it also because otherwise it's, it's not going to change. Mm, not strictly true. No. Um, you definitely have to get them through the dehydration. Usually yeah. if you can get them through the dehydration and support them, they'll clear it on their own okay. um, well, for the most part, yeah. Um, the thing with the electrolyte solutions work because most of the causes of diarrhea hit the lower part of the small intestine where you absorb fluid using sodium and potassium, whereas in the beginning part of the small intestine, which is usually less affected by the bacteria or parasites that cause the diarrhea, um, water is absorbed using sodium and glucose pumps. And so the electrolyte mix is mix a glucose and an electrolyte and really stimulates water absorption in that first part of the small intestine. Um, so if you don't have the electrolyte solution, another thing that works pretty well is like a flat ginger ale with some sh uh, salt in it. Um, tastes really nasty, but it actually does a decent job of hydrating an animal with diarrhea. Um, isolating, of course, and then considering antibiotics, especially if in there that you know, below five days of age because there might be an E. coli involved. Um, diagnostic options would be a fecal sample would be your first go-to. Yeah, Gatorade works good too. As long as it's got like a glucose and a sodium in it, it's going to work pretty well. Um, that's not going to be so great. Um, what Dr. Bell, it stops the like a spasmodic type of diarrhea, whereas most of these are malabsorptive types of diarrhea. So it just sort of stops the intestine from contracting. So you're not going to have the same amount of diarrhea, but it's going to just going to keep that infectious thing in the intestinal tract. Um, so that's going to be better for a horse with like a spasmodic colic, not so great with neonatal diarrhea. Um, all right, so this was a case I had. It was a 4-H ram, um, three months old, fine in the evening, and then was found dead the next morning. Um, who knows what this organ is? It's been cut open. <coughs> yeah, so intestine. Um, and there's a bunch of little, it should be just sort of like smooth and pink, and there are a bunch of these bumps on it, and then we did a smear and found these little alien-looking things. Does anyone know what this disease is? Coccidiosis. Coccidiosis, bingo. All right, so this is one of the most economically important diseases of sheep. Um, it also affects goats, but less significantly. Um, there are, it's species specific, so a goat coccidia won't infect a chicken, won't infect a sheep, won't infect a horse. Everyone's got their own, but they don't cross species. Um, it's sort of the, the tip of the iceberg disease where you have, you know, the tip of the iceberg is ones that are clinically affected that have the diarrhea, and you might not have any of those. And then the, huge, the rest of the iceberg are animals that are just not gaining as well as they could be doing. Um, so diagnosis, they often don't have clinical signs. The vast majority won't have clinical signs. Um, they'll just have vague decreased production, maybe decreased immune function. It's difficult to diagnose. It's difficult to diagnose because you don't have clinical signs. Also on fecal exam, small numbers of coccidians are fairly normal in sheep and goats. And sometimes you can, you know, so like this... This ram lamb, we did a fecal float, and we didn't find a single coccidian egg in the feces because he died well before those, those parasites were producing the eggs. So a negative fecal doesn't necessarily mean that it's not there. Um, treatment is actually fairly easy. There are a lot of drugs available. Um, but prevention is really the way that, that I think is best to go. Um, so management is key. So the real bad parts for getting coccidiosis would be around uh, weaning time. So anything you can do to limit stress around weaning will help. Um, avoiding crowding. Uh, coccidian, it's a, it's a single cell parasite and it really likes moist areas. So if you've got a waterer that's leaking, that's going to be a really bad spot. If your feed's in sort of a wet place, if you're, if you're letting your feed sit for a really long time and the stuff at the bottom is getting wet, that's going to really contribute. Um, and the real problem with this is if there's fecal contamination of your feed. So if you're ground feeding or goats, which can figure out a way to get inside and poop in any feeder, um, that's going to also increase your problem with coccidia. 
Uh, so anything you do to limit your moisture, so checking waters, not having, you know, sometimes you have like a hose that just always drips in the corner. Um, trying to uh, not have that will help as well. Um, if you, I don't know if anyone here uses medicated feed. Um, it's typically, you might use it for your chickens as well. It's typically medicated for coccidia, and that's with either a, um, a bow attack or a decock are the two that are most common. Um, any questions about coccidiosis before we move on? What's the disease that has a deficiency in vitamin B? We will be getting to that as polio and cephalomalacia. Okay. All right, skin diseases. Um, has anyone here had ORF on themselves? I have. Helen has. <laughs> Um, so this disease is kind of a scourge of petting zoos. It's fairly common in young kids and lambs, and they get these crusting lesions around their mouths. And then sometimes they'll give them to you, and she'll get some crusting lesions on her teats. Um, so for the animal, it really only causes a problem, especially if it gets onto the, la the ewe's teats, because she'll be really grumpy about having those sucked. Um, so you can have some trouble with the lambs not being able to suck properly. Um, but for the most part, it's kind of a rite of childhood or lambhood or kidhood, and they'll just outgrow it. Um, where is a bit of an issue is that if there's a cut in your skin, like this person who's not wearing gloves, um, if there's a cut in his skin, he'll get inoculated with the virus, and then it causes these fairly nasty-looking lesions on your hand. They're not fatal or anything, but they are visually very unappealing. Um, and, and <laughs> Did you get them from a wild sheep or a domestic wild sheep? sheep? Yeah. Hands? Yeah. <coughs> Run out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other skin disease of sheep and goats that's worthy of note is ringworm, um, which isn't actually a worm, it's a fungus. Um, and you'll get these sort of white plaques over the eyes and nose. They'll have sort of a shiny look to them. And then on a person, they call it ringworm because it makes it sort of like this ring like pattern on your hand. Um, I think in vet school they told us 85% of vet students will get, a, get this at some point during their veterinary career. Um, or daycare centers. Or daycare centers, yeah. yeah. On their heads? Oh. <laughs> Be made fun of for sure. Um, ringworm is actually kind of tricky to treat. Typically, it will get better in about four or five weeks, no matter what you do. Um, over the counter fungal medications will work. Um, Crest toothpaste has actually some efficacy because of the fluoride. Um, but most of you just have to wait it out. It, yeah, it can spot cross species to species. They're different species. It's a fungus, of course. Um, and cats typically have Microsporum canis, which isn't really that effective in, infective in sheep and goats, but cats can also have trichophyton, which is. So it depends a bit on what species you've got going on, but it's fairly, fairly easily spread species to species. All right, so this is one thing you never want to have is to go outside and find an animal that was looking fine um, and have them suddenly dead, but it is actually fairly common in sheep and goats. They're prey species, so they tend not to show their illness until they're quite advanced. Um, so we're just going to talk about one cause of sudden death because it is quite common. Has anyone had problems with pulpy kidney disease? No. No, but it's one that I'm sensitive to, especially in the springtime when the kids, when the goats go out in the field. Yeah. Or, yeah. or your feed where you keep it so they don't have access to it. Yeah. Yeah, it can be quite devastating <clears throat> because it can kill large numbers of animals very quickly. So you can lose, you know, 50 plus percent of your herd or flock, you know, in a matter of a week. Um, and it typically gets the animals that are doing the best. So it needs, um, so the ones that are eating, especially if they're eating a lot of grain, so they have a lot of carbohydrate in their gut. Um, it'll trigger bacteria. So it's a bacteria called Clostridium perfringens. It's normal. Probably if we cultured every person in this room right now, you'd have that bacteria in your intestine. It causes a problem because it suddenly starts producing a toxin. And it's triggered to do that by having high levels of carbohydrates. So the lambs that are 
doing the best that are quite greedy, those are the ones that will go down from it. And this toxin, it's toxin type D, and it is kills extremely quickly, like within a matter of hours. Um, fortunately, there are a number of vaccines available, um, and we'll talk about vaccinations in a little bit, but um, it is one vaccination that is worth at least thinking about because the vaccine is dirt cheap, it's really effective, and it can be a real train wreck if you have a problem with it. And it tends to be one where you have no problem, no problem, no problem, lose a large number of animals, vaccinate for a few years, and then slowly forget about it, and then have another problem. Um, it's, um, so neurological disease, this is, uh, we've talked about this a few times, so polio and cephalomalacia. Has, is there a problem with polio around here? Have you noticed that you know of? I've had it once with, uh, had it once. with a Nigerian dwarf. Right. Where um, they, they started acting like very daisy, bumping into things. Mm -hmm. And then the vet diagnosed it as coccida, gave her vitamin B right away injection, and that helped. But she wasn't getting any better, so I was doing some research, and then I worked with the vet, and I ended up having to give her antibiotics because it had hit the membrane, the brain mm -hmm. membrane. And so I had to give uh, every six hours for a week um, antibiotics, and that's what And she turned around? Oh, yes, yeah, she came good. around. She's, uh, she's doing very well. Oh, excellent. Good. Yeah, I was touch and go, though, for yeah. like, like two or three weeks. Yeah, That's so... Scary. Yeah, very scary. Um, so polio and cephalomalacia, this is a long name. Most people just shorten it to polio. Um, it's caused by a deficiency in vitamin B. And you'll get an animal, often they'll be walking in circles. They'll be, they call it stargazing, sort of this yeah. position. Or they'll just like walk into a wall and just stand there with her. She used to put her nose on the wall to hold herself up. Yeah, like nose pressing yeah. and yeah, head pressing. That's probably listeria that's, yeah. Um, so the nice thing about polio, the really rewarding thing about polio actually, is it responds really quickly to a vitamin, like a thiamine injection. So um, a lot of people will just, a lot of priests will just have like a bottle of thiamine on the shelf. Lasts forever, dirt cheap, and it just, it'll turn them around like that typically within hours. You'll go from an animal that's looking almost dead walking in circles, and then they'll be fine. And you can't, is it hard to overdose? Really hard to overdose, yeah. I, it's just, it's a B vitamin. It's like you taking a B vitamin from the store. Any excess will be urinated out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if you have a neurological animal, just trying B12, I mean, it's a do no harm thing, and it might really turn them around. Um, the two other common causes of neurologic disease that we don't see that often uh, in BC, so I don't have slides on them, would be lead poisoning, which, is that an issue here? Potentially. Um, so... If there is a battery in a field, livestock will find it. Um, so if you're in a field where you've had, you know, a lot of cars in the past or something, or dead batteries or peeling paint can be a problem as well. Um, so that will cause the exact same signs as polio. It will look, exact, look exactly the same, but they won't respond to an injection of thiamine. And typically once they've reached the point of head pressing and circling, it's going to be hard to get that animal back. Um, the third cause of neurologic disease would be circling disease. So that's infection with the bacterium Listeria monocytogenes. Um, and it's typically within frozen silage, or if you have like a wet feed that's frozen, and then it goes in their mouth and travels up the nerve. And I wonder if that's what you had going on, actually. I don't know. Because that would respond to antibiotics, whereas the, the polio wouldn't. Were, yeah, they were very similar. And I can't remember the names now because it's been a few years. Um, but when I was researching it, they said, the two look at, I, the signs and symptoms look identical. Absolutely. And the one yeah. responds to a vitamin B, and the other one only responds to the antibiotic. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The only really the only way to tell them apart is to do like a CSF tap or to do a yeah, necropsy, I just, which you're not going to do when a sheep no, or a goat. No, I just worked with the vet, and yeah. together we were able to solve it. So. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean that's that's a really common approach. Is you try vitamin B. If that doesn't work, you try antibiotics and. Sometimes you'll get a bit of a transient improvement with vitamin B, like if there's a bit of a both thing That's going exactly on. That's exactly what happens. But it won't. You know, if it's a true polio, it'll just completely resolve typically quite quickly. Um, so skinny animals. Skinny animals are something that you know, pretty much everyone who has enough animals has had to deal with at some point. Um, 
Has anyone had problems with CAE at all or heard of CAE? Oh, I've heard of it. Heard of it? It's down south quite common. All it, yeah, it's quite common, yeah. Most herds are tested yeah. for that. Yeah. But I've never heard of it up here. No problems up I, here that you know, know of yet? Excellent. I know that better than I would. Yeah, so CAE is, it stands for cat prion arthritis and encephalitis. And that's the goat form, and maybe visna is the sheep form. And they're very, they don't cross species, but they're very similar diseases. So it's, they're caused by something called a retrovirus, which is the same viral family as AIDS or HIV is. Um, so they have sort of a similar course where you're infected quite young. So typically these animals are affected at birth. And then you don't see any signs of it until they're generally quite old. So it can cause a bunch of different things. So the most common would be an arthritis. That's what we see the most. Um, we see that especially in goats that are sort of pasture pets, you know, the ones that live, you know, they're 12, 13 years old, you'll start to see an arthritis pretty commonly. And that's often from a CAE. Um, you can also see some neurologic disease. Um, so, again, you might see some head pressing. This goat just looks completely uncoordinated. Um, so some neurologic disease is fairly common. Sometimes you'll see a pneumonia where they... And it's not so much of a cough, but they just look like they're really working hard to breathe. Like their necks are long. They might have a bit of a heave line. So they're just, their lungs just lose compliance, so they can't inflate them properly. Um, you'll get sometimes get a, what's called a hard bag, so their udders will be hard as rocks. Um, but often what you'll just see is a, a skinny animal with a CAE. And there is a blood test. Uh, do I talk about this? Yeah. Um, so they're affected early in life. It's really common, so it's 65% in Canadian dairy goats. Only 9 to 35% of those dairy goats will display disease, and it really varies herd to herd um, how significant the burden of disease is. It's probably due to strain differences in the virus, but we don't know for sure. Um, there is a blood test available, so if you are buying an animal in, you can ask if they've been CAE tested, and that means that they've done this blood test, um, and there is no treatment, so it's... If, especially if you're buying something as a pet and that's going to live for a long time, it's nice to make sure it's CAE negative. Any questions about CAE? Oh, perfect. Um, I do have one. You can prevent it by early weaning, so, or just taking them away from you right away? Yeah, you have to take them away pretty much immediately before they've had a chance to suck at all. Right. Okay. And then you're feeding them the colostrum. Right. Um, and you, if you're take them away immediately and you're feeding them colostrum, that's where you'd need to do the heat treating, the 56 degrees for 50 minutes of the colostrum to kill the virus. Unless you're using the... the or the cow colostrum or the yeah, or powder colostrum or someone else's. Yeah. But if you want to use that uh, doe's colostrum, you need to heat treat it. Otherwise, there's no point in taking the lamb away. Since it's so prevalent down south, is that something that might be added with the vaccines that, um, with the vets? There's no vaccine for it, unfortunately. Oh, you mean like testing under the vaccine? Yeah. They got that mm -hmm. yeah. Adding testing under? Under the vet program? Pardon me? Currently, it wouldn't be. Okay. Yeah. There are categories, there are a lot of diseases that are just kind of, especially those that are fairly common, that are sort of production-related diseases that government doesn't necessarily need to be involved in. Okay. So it's in that category. Thank you. If, if you guys, Mary, just if you were taking a sample for something else, we could certainly pay the actual, like if you're already taking the blood sample, it's going to the lab, they would run it through a bunch of different tests. We could, we oh, all yeah. target. Ask and then pay the difference. Oh, yeah, and additional testing and stuff like that. That we would okay. just be responsible for it yeah. and you guys would cover the ones for the reportables. Okay. For 10 bucks. Yeah, yeah, 10 bucks of blood samples. Seems, uh, Pretty decent deal. Yeah. 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 And it's, this one we'll talk about in a second, but the CAE test is pretty good. Like, there's fairly decent, like, not too many false positives, not too many false negatives. It's a good test. Um, not like Yoni's disease, which we're going to talk about. <laughs> Has any, have people here heard of Yoni's disease? Yeah, a few people have, yeah. Um, people at the Wildlife Preserve know all about it. <laughs> Uh, so it is a bacterial disease. It's caused by a bacterium called mycobacterium. So kind of related to the tuberculosis bacterium, not the tuberculosis bacterium, but in the same bacterial genus. Um, it infects the gut. It, they're, again, they're typically affected quite young in life. Um, and then 
they don't develop disease until two, three, four years of age. Um, and this bacteria will replicate in the gut inside a cell called a macrophage. As you get a gut that's just really thickened with a large number of macrophages that have the bacterium in it. So if you open them up and you look in the intestine, it'll look like corrugated cardboard because it's just so thickened. And there's no way any nutrients can cross across that thickened piece of gut. Um, so they basically waste away. It's really common in dairy cattle, and in dairy cattle you get a diarrhea. In sheep and goats you often won't see a diarrhea. Sometimes you will, but um, goats and sheep were adapted to a desert environment, so they are extremely efficient at absorbing water from their intestinal tract. So you can have significant disease with just a really skinny animal, and you won't see the diarrhea. Um, so again, there is a blood test available. There's also what's called a fecal PCR. So PCR looks for the genetic material of this bacterium. Unfortunately, they are neither great tests. I mean, if you have like a full herd or flock, <coughs> you can get a good idea of whether it's present in that flock or herd if you have enough animals to test. On an individual animal basis, there's about, it's really bad. So it's about 35% sensitive in a one-year-old animal, meaning that there's a 65% chance that you have a false negative. And, and this fecal PCR has a similar sensitivity. They're both quite specific, so if you get a positive, you know it's a positive. But if you get a negative, the chances of it being a false negative are extremely high. Um, so they are very frustrating, and if you do go on, and a lot of people are doing these Yoni's disease eradication protocols, and that really makes them very challenging. So with an eradication protocol, you're testing, culling the positives. When you have so many false negatives, You'll be culling a bunch, you'll test again in six months, you'll have a bunch more positives, and so it can take years and years and years, and you can cull a significant proportion of your herd. Um, yeah? Yeah? In captive reindeer? Yeah. Hmm. They just cut, like, cull the whole. Wow. Yeah, it's a very frustrating disease to deal with. Um, you can deal with it again by catching the lamb or kid as soon as they come out, heat treating the colostrum, and then bottle feeding, but that's a lot of work as well. Any questions about Yoni's disease? All right. If they had reindeer raised by my I mean, never say never, but it typically only affects animals that are quite young, um, so usually less than four to six months of age. Um, so probably, unless you had your really young stock and they were eating, it's unlikely, unless they're eating feed that was contaminated with feces from those reindeer, it's unlikely to be a problem. It's another one that you typically will buy in with a new animal. All right, Casey's lymphadenitis, we've talked about a bit. So this is just another picture of the, the abscesses. They have a characteristic, almost onion-like appearance to them. And this is a look at it. This is a goat with the internal form. So you can see um, their abscesses is all... So externally, the goat looked fine. He was just a bit thin. And then their abscesses all throughout the liver. Um, so that's another cause of a skinny animal. All right, so you have a thin doe. What are our top five most likely causes? So we've talked about a couple of them. We've got yonis, CAE, not feeding them enough, poor feet, poor teeth, that's what I had. parasites, yeah, so feed quality or access, um, dental disease, yonis disease, parasites, and caseous lymphadenitis are our top five. Um, who is anyone here vaccinating regularly? Regularly-ish? Yeah. What are you using if you're doing it? Um, I am, it's from the vet, and I can't remember what it is. It's in... Tazvax? Tazvax, Covaxin, yeah. Cluster Shield? No, the second one. Covaxin. All right, so that's a Clostridial one. Um, so does everyone know how to vaccinate? Probably not. So, so Isn't it subcute? Yeah, typically you want to go under the skin. Typically you'll do it in the neck, because especially if it's a meat animal. Um, because you don't want to have, you know, sometimes you can cause a bit of a scar, and that's going to be not tasty. Um, so 
to right sort of on the side of the neck, pinch a little tent of skin, put the needle in, draw that, make sure there's no blood, and give the vaccine. All right, so these are all the vaccines that are approved. These are actually all the ones that are approved for sheep. There are no vaccines approved for goats in Canada. Um, the vast majority, which we're going to talk about in a second, uh, all of these three are for the clostridial diseases, um, but we'll go through them one at a time. Um, so the clostridial vaccine is the one that I think is worthy of consideration by everyone who has sheep and goats. Um, it protects. It needs to protect against clostridium perfringens C and D, um, and ideally also tetanus, especially if you're doing um, elastrator band castration. That's a really good way to get tetanus. Um, so it, it is nice to have that protection as well. Um, these are the ones that will cause sudden death and can cause it in a significant proportion of your flock or herd. And we often run, not often, but sometimes, usually it'll be in a flock, no problem for years. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, you have an issue with them. Um, there are a number of different options. So there's, um, what is this, about eight different options. Typically, they're equivalent in terms of efficacy. It'll depend on what your vet clinic stocks um, and what they're used to. Some people anecdotally have had problems with cluster shield in goats with vaccine reactions. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty much up to your vet clinic what they prefer um, and what you've had luck with in the past. Um, typically, you'd vaccinate around 8, 12 weeks, booster in 4 weeks, uh, and then vaccinate the dams typically 3 to 4 weeks before giving birth to boost their immunity before they give birth so they can pass those antibodies on in the colostrum. Um, there are vaccines for caseous lymphadenitis. Typically, it's not recommended to vaccinate unless you're having a problem with caseous lymphadenitis, and the reasons are that one, it's not an amazing vaccine. It'll decrease the burden of disease, but it won't decrease infection rates. Um, and also, you can't do the blood test if they're vaccinated. They'll all be, it'll be a false positive. Um, so typically, if it's present in your flock, the vaccine is worthwhile because it will decrease your losses to caseous lymphadenitis. Or if you have a high risk management. So if you like to buy animals at auction or multiple animals from multiple sources, you know, because that's part of, you know, some people's business plan is they buy animals as cheaply as possible from multiple sources, and that's how they you know, earn a living is by making their inputs cheap. Um, so then having a caseous lymphadenitis vaccine might be worthwhile. Or if you go to shows quite often, it's also maybe worthwhile thinking about. Um, it will decrease the disease level and shedding and the risk to other animals, but it won't eliminate infection. So you still can get abscesses, and you still can get positives. So you'll get a 58% reduction in the internal form of the disease and a 90% reduction in the external form. So even in the face of vaccines, it won't be 100% protective. And they may test positive if you do the blood test. Uh, goats, it is off-label, though we do very recently just have a new vaccine licensed in Canada, Glanvac 6, um, which is not labeled for goats in Canada, but is labeled for goats in Australia. Um, and I talked to someone last week, who, a few people last week who tried it, and no one is reporting any vaccine site reactions. So that is good and a good option coming up. Um, it's not for use in pregnant animals, this vaccine. Um, so the new one I was talking about, so before we used to get them all from the Colorado Serum Company, um, which was frequently on back order and it had really a lot of problems with vaccine reactions, especially in the goats. Um, but recently Zoetis has put out this Glanvac 6, which is sort of your one-stop shop if you are going to be vaccinating for cases of lymphadenitis, because it also has the clostridium protection. So it's got clostridium C and D, tetanus, um, one that causes blackhead, and a couple of other clostridial diseases, as well as the caseous lymphadenitis. And at least so far, we're seeing a lot fewer vaccine reactions from it. And that just, I think that just came on the market this September, so it's quite new. There was Glanvac 3, I think, but then it went off the market for a long time. Yeah. Have you tried this one? No. Yeah. No, yeah. No. It's just. I think September this year it came back. Well, there you go. You don't need to. You're good to go. Um, there are some vaccines for Chlamydophila abortus and Campylobacter abortions. Those are pretty much only vaccines you're going to use if you have a problem with that in your flock or herd. You're not going to just do it. Um, so, are people here using antimicrobials on their own very often? Too much? No. 
Um, so at least in BC, I don't know what it's like in the Yukon. You can buy antimicrobials at any feed store. Um, and it's very common that people will buy antimicrobials and just sort of do it themselves. Um, so it is important to talk to your vet because there's a lot of diseases that you, know, you have, you know, even though it gets that bacteria, it doesn't necessarily, you know, some are better for pneumonia, some are better for diarrheas. So to make sure you're using the right drug. And then also, does anyone know, everyone know what withdrawal times are? So those are times where you're not allowed to sell or the oh, meat yeah. or the milk for cons human consumption. And so anytime you give a drug, you should look at the bottle and they'll say meat withdrawal and milk withdrawal and make sure to obey those times. Um, and they're, you know, different drugs are different times. Like I think you know, some of the antibiotics, it's like a three-month milk withdrawal and then there's some that have like zero milk withdrawals. Um, all right. Are there any questions at all about disease and parasite management before we move on to some case studies? Yeah. What, so it seems to me like we have kind of a unique opportunity here that we're so far, like far away from everything. Would you recommend some sort of like a different approach in terms of being more aggressive in eradicating some of these diseases if you could? Like, Not that I necessarily want to be up all night bottle feeding lambs every year to get to this ultra clean flock, but is there, you know, obviously down south, you can't get rid of a lot of these things without some crazy protocols and whatnot. Would you see a different approach here? Like, we have another opportunity to, to maybe rid ourselves of them? As them opposed, here? Yeah, instead of dealing with them, Prevention. not having them. I mean, I think, I think there's a lot to be said for being really careful with what you buy. Um, especially because, like, the stocking density here is low and you're not on top of your neighbors. So, you know, in, you know, down south where you're really close to the next-door neighbor herd, you can have as clean a herd as you want, but you might get something from your neighbors. Like, you do have an opportunity here to keep really closed flocks and be really careful with what you bring in. But I don't know if you have anything to... I think, I, I think it's just weird that, like, you know, the opportunity depends on buying to have expectations on the person that's selling you. You're, you're bringing your dollars to the table. It's legitimate for you as the buyer to say, I need to understand the health status of your business. Because it's not, health issues aren't a big cost of production until they're a disaster. You know, we're, we're, always, we're always concerned about the cost of feed and that's the biggest input. But health issues, oftentimes you don't ask and you don't demand of the seller that, that they provide you with evidence. You go on their, on their good name or on their, uh, their say so that what they're selling you is, is healthy. Uh, there mm -hmm. is, and I think the value of the testing based on this is it highlights the scope of testing that is available potentially for people and for you as a buyer to ask for it even in testing. Assuming you have them already, I mean, it's only worth the price of a piece of paper that someone's presenting you with, but maybe that's 11 months old and maybe they've been infected. So once you have them here, then I think most people, well, you might go down and get the odd animal, but like mine are, are here. They're not going anywhere except for the avatar or, yeah. the or whatever. So then I would then have the opportunity to get rid of some of these things upon testing, seeing if they're present, and then to be a little more rigorous if they get rid of them. So they don't yeah, stay for sure. Yeah. Sorry for our YouTubers. The question was that you know, because in the Yukon there is is it the Yukon or just Yukon? It's the the <laughs> Yukon. Okay. I struggle with that every time. I'm like, oh, do I say the or do I not say the? No, it's not how you say it. No, it is. You say it. Oh, you don't say. It. Yeah, I'm in the. It's controversial, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question was, in the Yukon or Yukon, whatever you prefer, um, it seems like there are a lot fewer diseases, and because all the you know, lower stocking density, all the animals are being brought in, that we have a bit of an opportunity to have a territorial flock that is free of a lot of the diseases that are a real scourge in the south, and if it was maybe worthwhile being a bit more aggressive at eradicating disease. Um, I don't know if or Mary wants to... Or preventing it from entering, I think, is... I think we're all in agreement that that's, well, worthwhile. Um, I, maybe Mary could comment, but I think it probably is still up to the individual how aggressively you want to pursue eradicating a disease. 
Um, and different people are going to fall at different places on that continuum, how aggressive they want to be. And especially for these ones where you have to wean at birth, like that's, it's a lot of work. And for a lot, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure all of you actually have full-time work or have another source of income outside of your farm. Um, so you don't necessarily have the time to do these intense eradications. So it, I think it's going to be, like anywhere, it's going to be case by case how aggressive you eradicate. If you have a small group of animals, you may be better off starting again. Okay. Right? If, if you have a significant health problem. So first you want I, to I would rather do that than, than orphan animals and hand raising first one. Okay. You know, if you've got half a dozen ewes and you know that half of them are affected with yonis or CAE, start again. Yeah. Right? If you can afford to. Right. And I mean, it depends what you're doing with them. Like if you're selling for meat and you've got Yoni's disease, usually you don't get signs of disease till they're three or four, so you've often slaughtered them already. Um, so it's not it's not going to be a problem with your bottom line so much as, as the other ones. You guys are lucky. You've got some really great resources. You've got funds to help pay for it. Ask the professionals what they would recommend and how would they would tweak your management. If your goal is is a hundred percent high health flock, which is going to make your life easier, then ask for advice. And, and I think that's often the case. And it's, it tends to be how we regard everything is that it's, it's not a case by case basis, right? It's on a farm by farm basis. There's not. Nope. Sorry. <laughs> There's not a one-size-fits-all solution for people. People have different agendas. They have different objectives. And it really it involves sitting down and having that conversation in the same way as you develop a, a farm plan for your layout and your, your fencing and other things. You can develop a production plan or a genetic plan with respect to your livestock. And we can be one part of assisting with that, uh, as can practitioners and, and other experts. And the other thing is we tap into, I think one of the big advantages we have is we're part of a network, and so we can tap into information from across Canada and, in fact, even global aids to assist in, in that kind of decision-making. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I see there's some snacks in the back already, and I think the people who are here for wild and domestic sheep's eyes are crossing. Um, because they couldn't care less about Cox City Houses than <laughs> domestic sheep. Um, so why don't we take a bit of a break here and then... Oh, we have another draw. Let's do a draw. Card any card. Trevor Stronchinsky. The winner is... <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a 15 minute break or so. Um, snacks in the back, coffee on the side, talk to your neighbors, um, and then we'll come back with Wild and the Magic Sheep. Should I do the right cement, or should I just center it with a 24-inch? I know. Just cost-wise, what I get? Yeah, like here. And then putting beans, you know, between the middle will be cemented because that's where my mom will be. Yeah, I mean, it is. And then on either side, I was thinking of putting beans with rocks underneath so that because that's actually standard in my solar. Yeah, okay. And so, and peas, and then every few years I've just changed the beans. Well, in terms of way over here. Good distance, right? Yeah. Three hundred feet. Oh yeah. What do you think is the better route? Why would beans? Why would you decide to go around? Because because I get first frost and it's just too cold in the winter. For your health? Oh, really? Even with the bedding and stuff? Yeah. And it's a paint clean. I mean, I was fucked. It's just straight to the gravel. That's how I was like, oh, yeah. gravel and stuff. Yeah. I need beans underneath. Okay. Because then it's much easier to clean. And it would just be a... Or plywood or something. The choice of where you want to stick it. Like, if you pour the slab, you can slab it. Yeah. But, because then you have advantages. Yeah.
Right. He'd probably be looking for fifteen thousand dollars for some fish. Go for a whole slab. What's the footprint? Twelve by twenty six by thirty six. Like I'm four twenty five. Oh, wait a minute. Twenty five by forty. I expect to go five hundred. Very much to my twenty. My two foot. Okay. No, you're right. Yeah. We're on ten around. Yeah. Because when I got them, I paid. I paid two thousand for the footy. He hasn't given me exact number, but I'm prepared to go on the six for the rest. Because he'll just be doing some demo work still. And I get a fun yeah. 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 I would go fun. You can afford it. You just go fun. You know, never ever have a problem. The cleanup is like, I'm so glad to have a chance to do that. All the dental assistants. For some reason, the boyfriend's dad had a self-loving fault uh, concrete fix. And he was like, I bought bags. I bought a whole bunch. Just whipped it up and poured it in just level. Which in here, it makes so yeah. much different. Yeah. And, uh, like, I'm sure it would replace that the way already makes sense yeah. in the past six years. So, yeah. it's just cost. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I would mostly, um, it, I want the animals to heat it, so I'll be super insulated. But like, yeah, what they, what they do now, what they tend to do now is pull, put foam under the slab. Yeah, so it doesn't, it's like, so it doesn't get <clears throat> it or the, the cold doesn't get it and, and, bite, and also, so that, that's like, well, they're going to be just building a fluid. The, the heat migrates down to the slab, or you've got any permafrost uh, or anything in there, and hang them on the slab. Yeah, so, it's really good idea to translate a little bit. But it's expensive. I'm finding all the books. I'm finding all the books. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. And that went back to the more because she was on more parasite resistance. Or anything that helped clean up the past. I haven't seen it wrong with I do have one nice thing to preach it from the show. I thought, you know, people are going to hear about it. I don't know if you're going to be like, morbidly obese, that she has no future. Maybe it's a problem trying to get around her, like, because she's just not right. It's it's interesting it's like, and I think they'll probably get to it more because I think there's some talk about really winning and help. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. 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 Sydney, just kind of, oh, she almost back to the park, and back there, back to the park. And then she said, wait, for the boys and girls, I said, yeah, the park, there's four boys. Nope, I'm not getting attached to them. She goes, oh, yeah, so, you know, you're not too busy. I'm like, hey, I never took you before. I told you it was going to happen. I'm not, I'm not even going to happen. Okay, well, we are going to I do remember the heartache of making her go like a couple of years. Everything was the end of the world. I know. I, mean, I, was, I remember being that year old, right? So, like, I was like, no. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there's always something new. She brought her when she had to bring her. And we had to bring everybody. Because I thought she had to change the whole thing. She had to change the whole thing. But, so, you know, I knew that she brought her back. And she got in. She's crying. You know. But I got smart, I didn't try to change it. I used to try to reason with it. Not that I didn't try to reason with it. Maybe my wife and I just like to let it go. Just turn the radio. <laughs> Well, she walked and then her brother's like, Don't you sound like you hear the sheep? No, my boy was like, I can hear the yeah. How do you know they want to be here at They don't. Yeah. 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 And it's funny because, like, speaking of that, I remember they were really down to, like, a credo and, um, yeah, I came outside and walked into the hot cake and just have to pee. And I was like, I really don't know if I'm going to be that much. I need to be that much. Yeah, the last one. Um, wow. Yeah. 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 She's got the play pen in her house, and the ball notes play. Well, I have to, because I know Andy will be doing Yeah. I mean, it's always more a function of the males that are multiples. Like, they're the yeah. original. It's always very important. Yeah. 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 I've never heard more than two. 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 I've never he
Well, I'm not a huge fan of the final. I never read out the movie, and so we can't do it. We thought, you know, something that was physically good. But I don't think it's ever going Just that outline. And the looks of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, everybody, two-minute warning, and we'll start uh, with Helen in a few minutes. Okay, we are at the we are at wild and domestic sheep interactions that part of the program and I am happy, thrilled to introduce Dr. Helen Schwanja. She is the wildlife veterinarian for British Columbia and has been responsible for the Provincial Wildlife Health Program since 1992. The program provides uh, wildlife veterinary science advice and services, including the diagnosis of wildlife diseases and surveillance. She focuses on species at risk and their conservation. Dr. Schwanja also has or is an experience, as we've heard from her earlier. She is an experienced sheep farmer, uh, raising her healthy flock near Duncan on Vancouver Island. Please welcome Helen Schwanja. Thanks, Jennifer, and uh, thank you very much for allowing both Glenna and I to come up and speak to you. I think Glenna did an incredible job. Every time I hear, I do learn something, and she may be young, but she's enthusiastic, and uh, let's keep picking her brain. Um, thanks, Glenna. Uh, and, I, and I think she set up things really well for the rest of us. I'm going to try to <clears throat> just leave that like that, because I'm not really that much of a microphone holder. Uh, can you hear me all right? And can you yeah. see this okay? Uh, I have a, a fairly enviable position because I am on both sides of the fence. I've been working in this business for a very long time. I am an experienced large animal practitioner. I've wrenched just about everything from frogs to grizzly bears, and I continue to do that. So I have a, I have a perspective. But one thing that wasn't included in my biography was after I graduated from vet school, I wanted more, and I wanted to do wildlife. That was my, my dream. And I realized after practicing for a while that I really couldn't do it without some more education, which after vet school was not really very palatable. But I, uh, So I did some traveling, and I came back to the, the country to pick up my dog in my car in Saskatoon, and I walked into uh, uh, an, the office of one of my professors that I rather liked, and I said, I want to do, I, I do a master's. And uh, he was a pathologist because I figure, like Glenna, like Mary, 
like Jane, um, the only way you could do wildlife was working on dead ones because at that time there really wasn't any other avenue to do that. So he said, what do you want to work on? And I said, something bigger than a bread box, uh, not birds, not fish. And he said, how about bighorn sheep? And it was like, yeah, okay. Should be easy to work with. They live on the side of the road. <laughs> I know something about sheep already. And he said, well, there's been a big die-off in British Columbia. I just came back from doing a bunch of postmortems. They really need some help. So why don't you go to Victoria and talk to this guy? <clears throat> so put the dog in the car, drove to Victoria, knocked on this guy's door and said, hi, I'm a vet. I'm interested in working on bighorn sheep. And when his mouth got picked up off the floor, because vets weren't interested in that in those days, um, the, my road towards where I am today started. And, and that, um, that road was doing a master's on bighorn sheep health in the East Kootenai region of British Columbia. Um, I was fortunate in picking that species because it did die. It had a lot of health problems and continues to do so to this day. But even better than that, I worked with people that were very gracious, very giving, very generous of their time and their expertise. And I, I really got a very good education about how wildlife management works and how health plays an integral role. So after that, um, I got involved in this. At that time, there was a little bit of a different comprehension about what made bighorn sheep die. And over the years, even since my tiny short career, even that paradigm has changed. We have a different idea now. And part of that is because if, if any of you have read the literature about wild sheep versus domestic sheep health, um, or just wild sheep health in general, it's confusing because the old literature says certain things were a problem, the new literature says other things are a problem, and there's, it's a little bit difficult to put it together. So I'm really hoping by this talk today that I can help straight, straighten some of that for you and so we can start working together instead of in opposition because sometimes this gets extremely polarized. You think Yukon's bad, Sometimes we think BC is bad, but neither is as bad as the US. So, without any further ado, why are we here? Um, this is my overview. Maybe I do need to pick this up. What I'm going to talk about first is what we see with wild sheep help in general. <clears throat> and then secondly, how are domestic sheep involved in it? Uh, what are the tools that have been used in the past and what are we using now? And I can talk about the past. I may be not be quite as much of an elder as Jim is, <laughs> but I'm on my way. <laughs> and so I do know about some of these older tools. The new tools that are coming up, the technology is brilliant. It's wonderful. And that's one of the reasons why we can say some of the things we can today versus 20 years ago. So there are some new technologies, new information, and new approaches. So let's talk about some facts. Wild sheep are very closely related and susceptible to the same diseases as domestic sheep. They're not, even though they look quite different, some have hair, some have wool, um, they are very familiar with each other and in fact can crossbreed. Um, wild sheep respiratory immune function is less effective than domestic sheep. We'll talk about some of the reasons why, but just walk away from here knowing that wild sheep are very sensitive and cannot fight infectious organisms quite as effectively as domestic sheep. Goats, well, they're, well we all know they're a little different. Um, in all species, including ourselves, stress is a big issue. So if you have a stressed population, whether it's domestic sheep, goats, mountain goats, wild sheep, all of them can impact immune function. And I, and I think Glenna did a really good job of talking about how even uh, nutrition can cause stressful uh, conditions to animals and it impact immune function. <clears throat> Most infectious organisms are a lot more common in domestic sheep and goats than wildlife. Um, and it... Let's just try to limit this to domestic sheep. What we've done with domesticating this, this species is we've made them much more used to being in close contact with each other. Um, we've selected for animals that have rapid weight gain, uh, animals that behaviorally are very comfortable with each other. Wildlife, not so much. So wild sheep have evolved to live in small populations 
under specific habitat conditions, sometimes mixing at some times of year, sometimes wandering off and finding new females, et cetera, but, but a different pattern. Domestication has changed the species that we work with, the goats and the sheep. Contact between, I'm sorry this is such a busy slide, but that's why I've done the animation just to, to punch it home. And I, and I think these slides will be available to you if you really want to catch up on some of these fascinating points I have here. Contact between domestic sheep and domestic goats and wild sheep and goats has resulted in pneumonia outbreaks or die-offs in the wild animals. Now, I'm, you might have noticed that I'm including wild goats, and there are cases in the wild where mountain goats have been affected exactly the same as wild sheep. And, and when I say wild sheep, I have to really say bighorns. So I'll give you an example. In Nevada, they have populations of bighorn sheep where they have had pneumonia die-offs. The mountain goats that are next door have the same pathogens causing the same kind of respiratory tract die-off. So when we talk about wild sheep and goats and domestic sheep and goats, we kind of we kind of lump them a bit because the risk is there for, for both sets of species. Pneumonia in adult bighorns has been probably the most significant thing in the literature in terms of the health of wild sheep. And this term die-off is, is very characteristic. It's pretty much accepted as a term, and it really involves a, a wide-scale die-off or pneumonia outbreak in wild sheep, and, and I have to say primarily bighorns because we don't see this pattern in thinhorn sheep yet. A high percentage of the herd will die very quickly, sometimes unnoticed because it happens in the backcountry, uh, but a, a up to 95%, maybe 35%, somewhere in there, these animals die. And when they die, we have in the past isolated a, a fairly large number of different kinds of pathogens, primarily bacteria, and pi primarily bacteria in the Pastorella family. Does that mean anything to anybody, what a Pastorella is? It's basically a respiratory tract bacteria, and there's a whole group of them that the names change, etc. If you look in the literature, you will see the term pastorella, you may see manheimia, you may see biberstenia, and unless you're a microbiologist, you really don't need to pay attention to those big words. They're just Latin terms that separate those species. But characteristically, we see a pneumonia. This is a, a bighorn with the rib cage peeled back, and you can see, can you see this? Back there, it's pretty light in here. <clears throat> but you can see chunks of lung actually attached to the rib cage as it was peeled back. The lung itself is very purple in the back. And in just trust me on this, there's tons of little abscesses, and it's a horrendous, you can't breathe with that set of lungs. So the result is dead bighorns. We also see lambs die, or the youth of the community. Uh, and they may die when the adults die as well. Uh, same kind of pattern you'll find. You might find some sick animals, but generally you just find carcasses. This little lamb has a different disease. What is it? Come on, Glenna went over this with you. Orf, yeah. has orf, sore mouth, contagious eczema. It's a viral disease. Bighorns get it just like domestic sheep, and generally speaking, they get over it in about four to six weeks. So lambs don't tend to die from that, but they will die of pneumonia during this die-off period. Or subsequent to the die-off, they may die at about six to eight weeks of age, and they may die directly from pneumonia, or they may be much more susceptible to predation. So you can imagine a group of coyotes chasing, a, or even a single coyote chasing a group of ewes and lambs. The lambs that don't have good lung function are going to are going to lag back, the coyote's going to be much more likely to get that animal. Same as a golden eagle pushing a, a lamb off a, a hillside. This pattern of poor lamb survival after the pneumonia die-off can persist for years and years and years and never go away. So you can imagine if you're a wildlife manager and your responsibility is this bighorn sheep flock on this hillside, used to be 200, now it's only 50, and there's no lambs born every year that survive, you got a problem. 
Um, we know now with the recent research that it's the surviving ewes that can carry and transmit pathogens to the lambs. That's what's happening to the lambs. The lambs have no immunity, immunity to fight it off. They die. There's no replacement. That little population may just wink out. So those are the two patterns that we see. Historically, when people looked at the lambs and the, and the adults with pneumonia, they cultured a variety of different pathogens from these lungs. As I mentioned, mostly bacterial, sometimes viral. And bighorn sheep and thinhorn sheep, as well as mountain goats, have their own species of lungworm. And those lungworm were found, and they were considered to be significant. However, that may or may not be true. Just because we found them doesn't mean to say that the animals aren't adapted to them and they really cause a huge amount of problem but there has been some association of lungworm. So if you, again, if you look through the literature, you'll see the phrase lungworm bacterial pneumonia in bighorn sheep caused a die-off, etc. Well, let's talk a little bit about these bacteria. Some of the species identified actually can produce toxins, and these toxins are called leukotoxins, and they directly impact white blood cells and kill them. <clears throat> so if you kill the white blood cells, you don't have much of a chance to fight back. The toxins themselves will destroy tissue, and this has become uh, another uh, piece of the puzzle that has showed that uh, these bacteria can cause significant disease in wild sheep. Some of these other bacteria are basically secondary invaders, and we've always wondered, why do we culture so many different bacteria out of these lungs? Um, because some of the bacteria don't really cause any problems all by themselves. So how do they get in there, and how do they cause this problem? So wild sheep pneumonia is usually caused, called polymicrobial, which just simply means many microbes, many bacteria. And it's quite often. The other interesting conundrum has been that it's very frequently, if you look at bighorn sheep die-off histories, there's often been an anecdotal report of domestic animal contact ahead of time. So you see some domestic sheep in contact with a ram, and then two months later, there's no bighorns left. Or you see carcasses. That's been a very repeatable pattern, if anybody was watching at all. So recently, probably... Um, I, I guess I would say in the last 10 to 15 years, technology has allowed us to demonstrate some more interesting things. We've been finding more things. And when I say things, uh, we're talking about mycoplasma ova pneumonia here. A very small bacteria with a very soft wall that's very easily transmitted. Has anybody not heard of mycoplasma ova pneumonia? Eh, I knew that. We... Um, we abbreviate it as MOV, or MOVI if you wish. The research has confirmed that this bacteria is present in pretty much every <coughs> documented bighorn sheep die-off during the present years, um, the recent past, as well as going back into historic records and looking at the pattern of pneumonia in histological sections under the microscope resemble this organism. So just another fact to keep in the back of your mind that mycoplasma appears to be present in bighorn sheep die-offs and appears to initiate the pneumonia. This picture here, well that's a dead lamb, this picture here is a lung and the normal lung is on the top of the lung. The head's on this position, the tail's over here and you'll see the lower part of the lung here is very dense and purple look looking and it looks kind of compressed. This is fairly typical of a mycoplasma pneumonia in any species, whether it's a human, an elephant, a rhinoceros, a domestic sheep, a domestic goat, or a wild sheep. Uh, mycoplasmas are a very rich family of, pa uh, of bacteria. Um, many species have them and within a species you can have literally thousands of different strains. So it's, it's very well known. The first time really, in my experience, mycoplasmas came into my world was when I was doing my pathology degree. And at that time, we were trying to identify all the organisms that were involved in shipping fever in cattle. You know that? Ever heard of that? 
It's a, it's a syndrome in cattle where you collect calves off the range from a whole bunch of different places, you put them in a feedlot, and they start dying. And they have a pneumonia that looks far worse than that. And it's a combination of things where the, the calves are stressed because they're taken away from their mums. They may or may not be vaccinated. They may or may not be on feed properly. They need a whole bunch of new calves from a different places. There's a whole bunch of different organisms, infectious organisms mixing. And what happens, in theory, if I'm current, and you'll remind me if I'm not, is that some pathogens can change the immunology of that respiratory tract and allow other pathogens to get in there and do their job. And that's what we're starting to see with mycoplasma in, in wild sheep. So here's a picture that's a little confusing. There's an electron microscope picture up here of the lining of an airway in, well, pretty much anything. The airway has a, a solid base of cells with tiny little hairs called cilia and then a mucus layer on top of that. <clears throat> that mucus layer and the little cilia or hairs are there to push particles out. So when you breathe in a, a cloud of smoke, all of these protective devices try to keep those particles out of your lungs. And if you happen to breathe in a few influenza viruses because somebody was coughing beside you or sneezing beside you, this is the defenses of your respiratory tract, whether you're a bighorn sheep or a small child. The mycoplasma acts right at this cilia or hair layer and paralyzes them. So they no longer can rhythmically beat and push this mucus and all the pathogens and particles out of the respiratory tract. So that's how it works. Um, if mycoplasma is present, it because it paralyzes or changes the protective defensive qualities of the respiratory tract, it allows other organisms into the lower respiratory tract to set up a pneumonia. So let's talk about mycoplasma and bighorn sheep. This is where the research has been done. And in experimental trials, uh, in primarily in, at Washington State University, but also in the Dakotas, bighorns and domestic sheep have been housed together. And 98% of bighorns died of pneumonia after living with domestic sheep that were mycoplasma ovo pneumoniae positive. Whereas 25%, and in this case, I believe it was only one of four, died of pneumonia after living with mycoplasma negative domestic sheep. That's, that's, that's an interesting finding. Probably more important, rather than looking at captive experiments, is to look at the wild. Uh, in the U.S., Bighorn herds between 2009 and 2010. And then subsequent to that, although some of that has not been published, 95% of bighorns dying of pneumonia, and there was somewhere over 5,000 bighorns that died in pneumonia outbreaks during that period of time. 95% of them, when cultured, sorry, not cultured, but when tested for mycoplasma, were positive for mycoplasma over pneumonia. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a minute about how we test animals for mycoplasma. It's not, very, it's not a simple bacteria to grow. We're basically applying some advanced uh, genetic testing to identify it. And that's what's done when nasal swabs are done, et cetera. We're looking at PCRs. However, um, when they looked at these herds, 36 of 36 were confirmed exposed to mycoplasma. And of non-die off herds, there was no evidence of exposure to mycoplasma. So this really set the world on edge. This was only, this was less than 10 years ago. And it, a lot of people didn't accept it right away. It was really quite concerning because it's like, all of a sudden now, instead of talking about lungworms and pasturella, you're talking about something we've never heard of before. So lots of controversy, but there was some facts agreed on that disease especially in the U.S., because that's where the majority of bighorns are, has been partly dis at least partly responsible for historic bighorn sheep die-offs or declines. We do know that domestic sheep can carry organisms that do cause pneumonia and oftentimes without apparent symptoms. Do we do now know, we now do know, or do now know, <coughs> that domestic flocks can also carry 
multiple strains of mycoplasma over pneumonia. What, if Jim has mycoplasma in his sheep, I know he doesn't have sheep, uh, they may be, he, he may have mycoplasma positive sheep, but Glenna may have mycoplasma positive sheep that have a different strain, that are less, it's less pathogenic, it's less virulent, doesn't cause so much problem. So just so you know that there, one mycoplasma might be quite different than another movie. Wild and domestic sheep are really social. They like to be together. They can crossbreed. You got a bunch of ewes in your pasture cycling. You can get a bighorn ram in there trying to breed them. So they're going to share feed. They're going to share intimacy. Captive and free-ranging wild sheep do die after contact with apparently healthy domestic sheep. So what do we do? I got a little bit of history in there. I got a little bit of more recent research. It's a big problem for wild sheep managers. So the first thing that started getting done in the U.S. was to desperately separate with buffer zones. Um, the U.S. system has a very <coughs> mixed mosaic of land managers. There are um, U.S. Forest Service lands, there's National Parks lands, there are federal lands of some strange variety, um, they have the U.S. Bureau of Land Ma Management lands, and all of these are managed a little bit differently. Um, more controversy with some. But the U.S. Bureau of Land Management in 98 came out with some guidelines. And what they came up with was an arbitrary distance of separation of nine miles. That, n that number came from some work that was done with radio collared bighorn sheep. How far do they travel? Um, wasn't really done with a lot of science, but it's what they came up with. So the guidelines, unfortunately, because they didn't have the science backup, uh, created a lot of conflict, a lot of poor communication. It was highly polarized and tons of politics. A bunch of lawsuits came out of it. Not a pretty situation. Um, the culture in the U.S. is pretty litigative. And they ran into a lot of cultural things where there's a, a ton of very old-time historic sheep allotments in grazing country where the bighorn sheep are present as well. And it's pretty hard to tell a family that has been using grazing land for over 100 years that they can't use it anymore. You can imagine how they felt. So what did we do? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if you were, some of you may be old enough, but in the uh, mid-80s-ish, we started using domestic sheep in British Columbia for vegetation management on forestry cut blocks. And at one time, we used 40,000 sheep a summer. We pulled sheep in from Man Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. We didn't have much of a BC sheep flock. And we started mixing flocks at numbers like 2,000 sheep. Um, it was pretty out of control for a few years. We knew we had some disease issues. We got pilloried in the press for having poor animal welfare standards. And we came up with, this was actually my first contract with the government, that we put together a set of guidelines on how we take domestic sheep out into the bush to graze them. What are the standards? What are the guidelines? And we came up with a buffer zone, because that's what the U.S. did, of somewhere around 15 kilometers, which is pretty close to nine miles. And, or maybe there was a significant geographical barrier, you know, the Peace Williston Reservoir or something like that. But we also took another step. We wanted to make sure that those domestic sheep were healthy when they went out there. So we went to the farm of origin and we inspected the sheep. We didn't allow any lambs on the blocks of under six months of age. We made sure they were vaccinated. And frankly, we made a difference to the sheep flock in Western Canada by doing that. Not only did we inspect on farm, but when the sheep got out to the blocks, we did surprise inspections. And actually, do you remember Peter Stockdale? I hired my, our old microbiology prof from vet school to go out and do inspections. He loved it. He had so much fun doing that. So he'd go out. Hmm? Oh, yeah. There was a ton of stuff that we had to clean up, and a lot of it only had really significance for the domestic sheep. But it taught us a lot about the domestic sheep health of, the, of Western Canada. And really, it was a good standard to use. I think. Um, we, we needed more tools, so we did started doing risk assessments as well. And if you look in the literature, 
Um, a risk assessment is a standardized way to look at a set of diseases and what their risk is to a set of organisms, humans, animals, livestock, and wildlife, etc. So we felt that was more objective, much more science-based, and there is a series of these done over the past couple of decades, some with really good hard data. Animals were radio collared and, and their movements were examined, um, both wild animals as well as domestic animals. Um, we've been able to use the web and access more people and more literature than ever before. So both in Canada and the U.S., we did risk assessments that included Northwest Territories, um, did one for sheep and goats and, and camelids. U.S. Forest Service and the, and the state of Idaho did a very extensive one in one of the U.S. Forest Service um, forest districts. California did some. Yukon has done some. Uh, in British Columbia, we're, we've co-authored some of these, um, but we also had uh, some concerns about llamas being used for packing. So we did a uh, camelid risk assessment in 2003 and repeated that again this past year. Um, so it's online if you wish to read it. We're not here to talk about llamas, but if you want a controversy, we've got that too. Um, research results. Um, we, we have literally spent millions on bighorn sheep health in this con on this continent. Um, you know, Canadians, they don't have much money other than in the Yukon. <coughs> but the U.S. has spent a significant amount of money. They've sponsored academic studies, field studies, etc. And over these decades, um, we have seen changes in, in knowledge. We've seen changes in patterns of disease. But we've got some really solid research findings. The last decade in particular, there's been some uh, tremendous people that have partnered up with us. These new, this new work has confirmed, I don't think with any doubt at all, that mycoplasma ova pneumoniae, MOVI, is transmitted from domestic sheep to wild sheep, and it's really significantly changed our focus. We now know that MOVI is common in domestic sheep and goats in some places where the work has been done. U.S. has done some surveys, not a lot. Most producers are not even aware of this organism, and that's the same in U.S. as well as Canada. Ontario's starting a study. They're going to do a slaughter check study. Um, we've started uh, a couple of years ago. We started doing some assessments of domestic sheep and goats in British Columbia, but in very limited areas. Um, Alaska is doing this now, and and it, and as I understand, you guys are as well. So. It, it can be common in domestic sheep and goat flocks and herds, and it can have health effects. The research that has been done so far has shown that the health effects can be very inapparent, but can cause low-grade respiratory disease, especially in young animals, and reduce weight gains. There's not a ton of work done yet, but it's coming. We do know MOVI initiates both wild sheep, at least bighorns, and mountain goat pneumonia outbreaks and that surviving ewes and probably nannies can carry and transmit mycoplasma to lambs. The disease patterns that result appear to be, they're not always consistent. They can show poor lamb survival for a couple of years, okay lamb survival for another couple of years, and then a disastrous lamb survival another couple of years after that. And the amount of work that's been done on this has shown that <coughs> Probably what's happening is that the ewes that are holding the mycoplasma in their respiratory tracts can die out. And so you might see lambs surviving for a while and then a new strain gets introduced from a wandering bighorn or a wandering domestic sheep. If I'm confusing you, I'll give you lots of chances to talk. So for BC, what have we done? <clears throat> and I don't mean to be a Pollyanna, but I'm trying. And collaboration has been the only thing that's worked for us. So what we did, after, actually after my master's, I recommended we talk to domestic sheep producers. And um, after I got hired, I had a little bit more authority, a little bit more ability to raise money and to make that dream happen. We started what we call the BC Wild Domestic Sheep Separation Program. It's now composed of a working group that is wildlife plus our agriculture staff, sheep producers, and NGOs, 
that are representing wild sheep. And that working group's real job is to, for communication amongst all those different groups. It's not perfect, but that's its job. We have lab collaborations, again, with our agriculture lab, but also with labs in the U.S. and other researchers. And that's for the diagnostics, because they're changing all the time. And let me tell you, I haven't got a clue what an immune system even looks like anymore, because when I graduated in 1981, a lot of these technologies didn't exist. We didn't know anything about, um, well, the PCR didn't exist, all this other stuff. So I can't keep current on that, and I need diagnosticians to steer me in the right direction. We have partnerships with academics, with again, with producers, again with domestic and wildlife health staff and with the NGOs to raise money to raise the capacity to do research. So we have been looking into disease mitigation research as well. We are a member of an organization called the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies which has a series of working groups under it and one of them is the Wild Sheep Working Group. 21 agencies punching money in, punching their resources in, punching their research in to develop and share research projects and resources. So some of the resources that have come out of that have been guidelines and standards for managing wild sheep as well as health testing wild sheep to try to complete this puzzle. Um, if you're interested, this is a very good website, the Wild Sheep Working Group web website. Every, it's very transparent, a bunch of different resources, all the reports and papers you ever want to read about it. And just Google walk what. WSWG, and you'll find it. So our sheep, I'm just a little bit about our sheep separation program. I'm, I'm here to tell you what we're doing. I'm not telling you what you need to do, but some of this might work for you. So the separation program has been uh, ongoing since 1999. Our original focus was to create methods for outreach, education of producers and wildlife folks, and ensure effective separation between wild and domestic sheep. We didn't know about Movi to start with, but frankly, we were ahead of the game. I'm pretty happy about that. Our current program coordinator is at arm's length. He's a contractor. His name's Jeremy Ayotte. Some of you might have met him. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, awesome guy. He's a great big, tall, lanky guy with silly long hair. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy. Um, he's a farmer. He's a biologist. He's passionate about hunting. He's passionate about agriculture. He's kind of perfect. And because he's at arm's length, it's not like the government's coming to talk to you. So it's kind of nice that way. He's primarily funded by another arm's length organization in British Columbia called the Habitat Conservation Trust Fund. I apply for funding every year, and when they're feeling good about me and Jeremy, they give us some funding. However, it's only a small pot of funding. One of Jeremy's primary jobs is to go out and get funding. So what does he do? He coordinates the efforts of British Columbia for separation. His primary job is to identify high-risk farms. High risk, when I say high risk, it's high risk of contact. He goes and he introduces himself. He sits down. He drinks coffee like Matt does. And if you want to develop a relationship with somebody, you sit down and you eat or you drink with them. Coffee, wine, whatever it takes. Beer. Looking at the the farm by farm status, uh, what the farmer's goals are, what they want to do with their animals, and develop mitigation plans if they're even necessary. We've done pretty much a whole bunch of different kinds of plans. We've done uh, conservation covenants. We've had people get rid of their sheep and, and just raise hay. We've had people get rid of their sheep and buy cattle. We've had people keep their sheep and we've help them build fencing. So a whole bunch of different kinds of mitigation. Jeremy fundraises and he tries to deliver these plans. It can be incredibly frustrating. We've had um, programs where we, once or twice we've actually built double fencing around a property and that landowner has turned around and said, well I'm going to buy a property down the road now, can you build me another fence? So that it, there's been frustrations as well. Everybody's not always as collaborative as we'd like to. So we've, we've started looking at some other alternative ways of delivering this. I can out-talk you, Quinn. <laughs> um, so 
in an effort to outreach even better, we've delivered town hall uh, seminars or town, I don't even like that term, just workshops and seminars in small communities where there's a high percentage of risk. Um, we've done that in partnership with our NGOs such as the Wild Sheep Foundation and the Wild Sheep Society of BC. We've had small workshops where we just talk about flocks and flock health as, as Glenna has done here today. We've talked um, at every opportunity we can, can find. And one of the new things has been to work with 4-H to educate the kids and help kids understand what the risks of, of disease uh, transmission are as well. Uh, the other thing Jeremy has been putting a lot of effort into in, in our working group is to support new research and try to develop some policy and regulations similar to what Mary's doing. Instead of going farm to farm, is there something we can do to make a difference on a bigger scale? And one of those is MOVI testing of both wild sheep and domestic sheep. So the research that we've done, uh, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of that. How long can I talk, Jennifer? Okay. We've been looking at, I, I, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a hoarder, right? I admit it, I'm a hoarder. I hoard serum and samples. And I, I'm glad I did, because if I hadn't, we wouldn't have learned quite as much as we've, had, we've been able to over the last little while. If you, if you take serum from an animal, you take a blood sample, spin the blood, out of, the blood cells out of it, and take the serum, that serum contains proteins called antibodies that are there to protect an animal from a specific infectious organism. So if we wanted to know if um, Jeremy had been exposed to influenza, we could take a blood sample, look at his serum, look for influenza antibodies. Well, we can do that with Movi too. Only trouble is there's only one lab that does it that we have access to at Washington State University. And it's not always 100% reliable. So if, but if we have a, a, a bunch of samples from a, a group of animals and we sample all those for exposure to Movi, we get a pretty good idea if there's been any exposure at all. So if we take a herd of samples from, I don't know, doll sheep in the Kluwani and we take 30 samples from a group of 100 sheep, uh, we get a pretty good idea of whether or not there's been any exposure. Probably not. We're now at over 200 samples from both wild sheep and wild goats in BC, and we've got some results, which I'll share with you in a sec. We've also been able to take swabs from the nasal passages of wild sheep and goats, and on, in that case, we're looking at an individual's exposure and ability to carry that organism. So if we take a swab and stick it up your nose, or the nose of a sheep or a goat, we can take that material and some magic happens at the lab in Abbotsford and they can pull out small chunks of DNA from Mycoplasma ova pneumoniae. That gives you an idea of whether that animal is carrying that organism in its nose and shedding it. I don't know, have you ever looked at the nasal passages of a sheep? Cut a head in half one day, it's really interesting because the sinuses go on both sides of the nostrils up towards the eye, and then they branch out into the forehead and then up into the horns, and they have all kinds of little pockets and, and cubby holes and stuff. So that organism might be in there, but it's not, it's not easy to get to. And with a nasal swab, all you're doing is going up just before the eye. You're not really sampling the whole nasal passage. But it, again, if you look at enough of those, it gives you an idea of whether that organism is present there or not. So we've been doing that on both live and dead wild sheep and goats. We're also doing it on taxidermy heads before they're stuffed. So we can pull them out of the freezer, we can swab their nasal passages, and that gives us an idea of if that particular animal was carrying Movi. Thin horns, what about them? You know, you guys don't care about big horns at all, really? Right? Sure you do. Say you do. Yes. Of course you do. Of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> But, you know, let's face it, thin horns are, are, are the Yukon. They are. And they are for us in northern BC, too. We, um, we have doll sheep, not very many, probably a couple hundred. We have probably, you know, six to 8,000 stone sheep. And just recent research has demonstrated that the stone sheep in BC are the original ones, and they are pure 
Anything closer to the Yukon border is actually a hybrid. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we got them all. And there was actually a glacial refugia in the Musquakachika north of Fort St. John where stone sheep evolved in the, in the beginning. So it's kind of cool stuff. But we don't know very much about them because they live in remote areas. Costs a fortune to catch them and sample them. And, you know, if you take a swab of an, uh, the throat of an animal to look at what organisms are carrying, you pretty much have to get that swab to the lab within mm, maximum 36, 48 hours, or you don't get a good result. So up until recently, we really haven't had ways of analyzing them the same way that we have bighorns. So we don't have a ton of information. Now we're starting to, because we've been applying some of these principles with archive serum, we've been sampling their heads, uh, we've been sampling live and dead animals, and we've got some idea about movie status, and we're getting some baseline health. The young woman that was here and left early today to catch a plane, Kylie, she, that's, this is going to be her master's, so we're going to really work hard on this. Pretty excited about it. So have BC wild sheep and goats been exposed to movie? Well, I'm sure you can't see this slide very well. I just want to take your eyes to the blue dots. Here, 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 here. All of those blue dots, we did not detect movi in. They're either goats or they're wild sheep. <clears throat> Didn't detect it. But you'll notice there's actually three circles that are red, and those are three individual animals that we got evidence of mycoplasma ova pneumoniae in their serum or in their nasal passages. Both of those areas two very distinct areas, had suffered bighorn sheep pneumonia die-offs in years just previous to those samples being taken. So that was significant to us. We have found it. So it, we have confirmed presence, but only where there'd been a recent disease outbreak. How, you know, what difference does it make whether we know Movi has been there or not? Well, we're not quite here yet, but some colleagues in, in Utah Again, where they have much larger risk issues, simply because their domestic sheep industry is huge. It's much larger. Uh, and they have a very um, valuable stock of bighorn sheep because they've had to restore them all. So they've translocated animals all over the place, etc. What they've done is they've strain typed the movie, and they've been able to see patterns of where strains are similar, such as these brown dots, or different, such as the red and green dots, where there might have been a, a couple of introductions. This particular population has only blue dots. So it's just a demonstration of, as a research tool, it's pretty cool that you can go this far. We're not here yet. What about domestic sheep? Yay. Wild sheep, domestic sheep. We've been doing this too. So first of all, we wanted to know if Movi was present in BC. We had no data up until a couple of years ago whether or not it was even there. And we reached out to um, an old, actually this guy taught me how to two-step in, in first year vet school. His name's Scott Mann. You remember him too? Because Mary was a year ahead of me. <laughs> and uh, he's now working at a university in Kamloops. And Scott was really interested in doing some kind of research project. So we asked him, would you be interested in this? We want to know if mycoplasma ova pneumonia is present in BC domestic sheep. And we thought it would be best to focus it because we had a limited amount of money. And we focused it in three areas of BC where we have seen pneumonia issues and we know that there's domestic sheep in the area. And that is the Thompson um, Nicola area around Kamloops, uh, the area in East Kootenai around Cranbrook, and then the Okanagan Valley around Penticton, Kelowna. Um, Scott went out and he nasal swabbed a percentage of sheep in 10 flocks in each area. And we had a really tricky way of doing this. Glenna and Lori would give a, a, a health workshop. Scott and I would come in, we'd talk about this subject and ask for volunteers. And producers were incredibly generous with their time and effort and we pretty much lined up 10 flocks in each area, and somewhere between all of the, flo all of the sheep in the flock or 10% of the flock were tested. And again, nasal swabbed, looking for the presence of the organism in their nasal passages. Um, there was a variation in percentage of flocks affected, but there was mycoplasma in all three areas. So 
We made sure that each producer had assurance that any information was confidential, so there was no information given out on whose flock was positive and whose flock was negative. That's really important. You don't want anybody volunteering if they're going to be finger pointed at, right? And again, most people had no idea about this. Now we, because we now know it's present in British Columbia, we need to start taking the next steps. And the steps that we're trying to do are to create some mycoplasma ova pneumoniae negative sheep flocks. We just focused on sheep here, and I know all of you are not sheep people, but we'll talk about goats in a sec. So Scott and producers have been trying to do this, and we've got some amazing producers in our province that are stepping right up. They went, hey, this is a good marketing tool. I don't know if you noticed, but I got a cell phone, and on the back of it I've got a sticker that says, wild sheep safe. And maybe that's a good marketing tool. If you've got a purebred flock of sheep and you want to breed it for breeding, pur you want to sell it, market it for breeding purposes, and you can say, we've tested for Mady Vizna, we've tested for CLA, we've tested for mycoplasma, it's free of all these. These sheep are wild sheep safe, maybe? Maybe a marketing tool. So that's one of the things we've been talking to both 4-H and the producer groups about. What's been done in the States as well um, is a, a really interesting tool, a little bit different. What happens if, um, if you've got a cattle ranch in Saskatchewan and tuberculosis is recognized in that herd? Do you know what's done? It's called, it's, it's called test and slaughter. Yeah. So every positive animal is tested, or every animal in the herd is tested, and the positives are slaughtered. <coughs> it's one of the reasons why we have very low incidence of bovine tuberculosis in the country, and we are envied around the world for our aggressive approach to that. So we talked about, shall we do this with mycoplasma OV, MOV domestic sheep? Should we test them and kill them? Well, that's one approach, right? But as you've heard, testing for mycoplasma isn't foolproof yet. Because these nasal passages are so contorted, you may not be able to figure out whether this animal is a positive or a negative very easily. A researcher in the States that we have a lot of respect for has been working with some big flocks. And his estimation is that probably, especially in a big flock, you have multiple strains of mycoplasma. Somewhere around about 30 percent of that flock will always be shedding that organism and can always be diagnosed. Doesn't matter how many times you swab them, they're always going to be positive. Somewhere around about 30 percent only shed that organism intermittently, so maybe every other week, who knows. And then another proportion of those animals have, have been exposed to these mycoplasmas, but they never shed. So you can never really be 100 percent sure that they're positive or negative makes it very hard to work with this organism, really, really hard. <clears throat> but we think that maybe if we remove the positives after we test, we can eventually find, get to a, create a mycoplasma negative flock and maintain it that way. Probably with intermittent, intermittent testing and lots of quarantine, lots of biosecurity when you bring animals in. We're not there yet. We don't know. And we're working really closely with our partners in the States to try to understand this better. But we're thinking that this might be a really great way to go. I'm going to give you just a little bit more background. And maybe, maybe I'm a little bit out of order here. But again, I got involved in bighorn sheep in the early 80s. <clears throat> the herds that I worked with were in the East Kootenai region of British Columbia down around Cranbrook. And historically, you know, if you read history books, it's pretty cool. You learn a lot, right? And the herds in that area had been reported to go through die-offs every 20 years or so, in the 20s, the 40s, the 60s, and then in the 80s. And it really was the only the 80s where there was a lot of advanced diagnostics done. 65% of those sheep died in multiple herds. It, it moved. It went from one herd to another herd. See you, Jane. Okay. Um, I did my research on this population. If I go back and look at those slides now, I'm sure there was mycoplasma there, but I couldn't test for it because we, that, did, that technology didn't exist. But the pattern in the lungs looked exactly like mycoplasma and looked exactly like what we see today. 
The other bighorn sheep die off historically that we talk about in BC happened in 1999. We had somewhere around 450 bighorns in that population in the South Okanagan. It probably decreased more to more less than half of what it was. I have these numbers here. I, I don't know if they're accurate or not. Again, a multiple herd pattern, animals moving between herds, spreading the disease. In that population, I was on, on board then, and we, uh, we were concerned because of this movement pattern, and I, I asked the regional biologist to shoot anything that coughed. So we created a buffer zone by shooting bighorns. It wasn't very well received, but we did it. Um, we had animals that had died of pneumonia necropsy, and the lab in Abbotsford at the time was the first place in North America, to my knowledge, that was doing PCR for mycoplasma, or at least the only place in BC, and we had mycoplasma recognized there. First time ever anybody did that on bighorns. Um, we had no lamb survival initially the first year. The only lamb that survived uh, was picked up by a golden eagle and dropped into somebody's backyard, and it had mycoplasma in its lungs. That herd recovered very quickly. I don't know if it was because we shot sick animals or we just got lucky, but it's one of the few bighorn sheep herds that has actually spontaneously recovered. We've had a population on, on the Fraser River in the late, in the, somewhere between the 90s and the 2000s, just a, never found carcasses, but just numbers went dive bond. Not good. Multiple herds again always has been poor land survival ever since, and we know we've got mycoplasma there. But we've seen that intermittent form where some years lambs died of mycoplasma. We had a colleague at uh, University of Saskatchewan go out with a grad student, and they actually cultured mycoplasma out of that, those lambs. The next year they went back, and the poor kid didn't get a thesis much out of it because all the lambs did fine the next year. So maybe a carrier you died. But these patterns are consistent. Again, a lung and dead animals. This is very typical of a, of a lamb with a mycoplasma pneumonia. It's less than six weeks. It's, it, its ears are tilted down. It looks sick. It's got a nasal discharge. And actually, if you open up the inner ear of this lamb, it's got mycoplasma pus and inflamed inner ear from mycoplasma. It's really quite neat if you're a pathologist. <laughs> but, but is this historic pattern, is that relevant now? Well, in 2016, we, um, you know, the press is always fun to government, and we have this article written by a particular um, news writer who doesn't really like government <laughs> very much, and he, and he basically ripped us apart in the press and said that this particular herd, chasm herd, declined from over 100 animals to less than 30 since the fall of 2013. And frankly, it probably happened that winter. Never found a dead animal. So what we're calling this now is we are assuming that this was a die-off. There's no other reason for animals to decline that much. We sampled the animals in that population. We nasal swabbed them, we bled them, and we did get positive some animals positive for mycoplasma, um, it shedding out of their noses, as well as serological evidence that they'd been exposed to mycoplasma, and they were um, grazing the same lands as a domestic sheep flock. We still don't have any lamb recruitment in that little herd. It's still at about 30. What about northern BC? Um, well, we have 100% of the global population stone sheep, thank you to the genetics, We've got a few hundred doll sheep, we've got a lot of mountain goats, and we have very few domestics. We're looking at this area as potentially, here's the genetic data, just so you know. So this is probably where the glacial refugia it was, and stone sheep are, are considered pretty much south of the Yukon-BC border, and then you get hybrids of doll sheep, stone sheep in that area, and you can duke it out with the geneticists. I don't really know very much about this stuff. But we consider now that we have the global responsibility for stones. We think thin horns are naive to domestic sheep diseases. We can't see why they would be exposed to that 
those, those diseases. And we think that there are dire consequences if some of these organisms like mycoplasma enter the thin horn populations and or, and or mountain goats. Our policy right now <clears throat> is, is to try to protect the thin horns using every tool that we can have. Um, we're creating buffer zones. We, are, we have banned domestic, uh, can't, well, domestic llamas uh, from being used for packing for hunting purposes. And we're talking about disease management zoning or having animals tested in the north. And if they're mycoplasma positive, they're not going to be there. So we're pretty serious about this right now. A lot of this is at the same stage. We don't have laws passed. We're discussing policy. It's, it's, a, it's a really slow process. And for people outside of the government, they think it's, it's not even a process. It's, it isn't just slow. It's, it's, a, it's a brick wall. But honest to God, there are lots of good people working on all, all sides of the fence trying to make this happen. But the key really is collaboration for us. You've seen this picture already. Um, I just want to give you something a little bit new that may, may be interesting to you or may not be. In 2011, we had, uh, I had a hunter send me this picture. And he said, what do you think about this? <laughs> I was like, oh my god. Um, it, I pretty much knew what it was just by looking at it. And I asked the conservation officers to go shoot this ram which they did, and we confirmed that he had a mange, which is caused by a microscopic mic that burrows into the skin and creates a lot of really intense itching in some places. Uh, in other places, it just creates a really heavy crusting. Seroptic mange is caused by a little, this little tiny mite right here. And primarily what it does in sheep, is in bighorn sheep, is cause severe crusting in the ears. Every once in a while, another animal, and one animal that's affected will be systemically affected with its whole body affected like that. It may be an animal with a really super poor immune system. We don't really understand why some are like that. The majority of them just have ear scabbing like that. But it's a, it's a mite that's present in a variety of species. Each species has its own seroptes, they think. They don't know that they jump from rabbits to bighorn sheep. Kind of a stretch, but maybe it's possible. Uh, thought to be host specific. Uh, it is, um, sorry, it is present in domestics internationally, but it was thought that Canada eradicated this mite from domestic sheep in 1922. So it has not been seen in, in British Columbia at all. So where did it come from? We recognized it in 2011. We have started a research project looking at other populations of sheep in the, in the province and have not found it elsewhere. Um, we have a PhD student, Dr. Adam Herring, working on some captive animals, trying to develop new diagnostic tools, uh, and trying to look at is there an option to treat it. So he has a group of sheep in a, in a pen, and he's been using some modern uh, miracle drugs to try to, to try to treat it so far. Unfortunately, we're not successful. So just on the bright side of things, this is my little blue-faced Lester. Kind of cute. Um, the domestic health science, it's not my job. I just do wildlife. Unfortunately, poor Mary has to do both. Well, unfortunately, just simply because it's confusing when you, when you have to try to keep everybody happy, right? My focus is primarily on the wild sheep, but because we're collaborating, we're working together with the domestic sheep people as well. So we need to know a little bit more about the stats of Movi. Is it, is it throughout British Columbia? And if so, how common is it? Can we eliminate it from flocks? And I think that's a real key step, especially since there should be some benefits to the domestic flock by eliminating this. If we can get better weight gains, reduce respiratory tract disease, even if it is subclinical, it's got to be a benefit to you. Absolutely. Um, and, and we need, do need to continue to understand the risk to wildlife from domestics and vice versa. Uh, by the way, back to that scabby old sheep. If he was in contact with a domestic sheep, the domestic sheep would get that mite from him. So what are the options for domestic sheep? ivermectin twice. Can we do that with wild sheep? That's the problem. 
So the future of wild sheep health science, I think we need to learn a little bit more about movie strains and their effects, uh, why they per persist in bighorns and, and how they affect lamb survival. Um, interestingly enough, researcher colleagues in the U.S. have also been sampling domestic goats and strain typing the mycoplasmas that they get out of them. Not just strain typing, but trying to associate those strains with bighorn health as well. And at this date, uh, it appears that the strains of mycoplasma that are coming out of goats are far less pathogenic and don't appear to be as much of a risk for wildlife which is really good news. That's not a hard and cold fact right now, but that's what it's appearing to be. And there's lots of work going on to try to substantiate that. So right now, it's looking like if you're a goat producer, you're probably lower risk, at least for mycoplasma. We need to understand if we can treat or manage herds to get rid of some of these pathogens, especially those that cause mycoplasma, pneumonia. Um, but then there's seropties and there's other health issues. What about, what about sore mouth? Do we want our populations of stone sheep to have sore mouth? Not really. We really don't want them to get anything if we can help it. If we can help it. Is there, are there new technologies that we can start applying to wildlife to improve their immunity, especially wild sheep, since they're not very good at it? And what are the other risks? Obviously, we have some issues with wildlife. In, in the world. We manipulate habitats, we disturb them, we will probably never see wildlife wait like, like we saw 100 years ago. I think, I think that's gone. Um, but can we keep them on the planet so that we can enjoy them in the future and our kids can enjoy them as well? And what are the other risks from other wildlife? So I, I really, I promote collaboration is the way to go. And I think we can use the science that we're getting now, distribute it, educate people, and use and, and try to convince people that it's part of the social value to keep wildlife on the landscape, as well as be able to make your family survive in a landscape that's perhaps not ideally suited to domestic livestock, but it's your life and you've got a right to, to live it the way you want to. So I think there's ways to keep both things on the landscape, and that's what we're trying to do in BC. So if there's any way that what we're doing can help you out, we'd love to try. Um, again, we don't have all the answers. Be careful what you read in the media. Be careful what you read from other people. Um, use a grain of salt. There's some really cool stuff in the future, and I think there are some incredible people working on this issue. So don't have all the answers, but if you've got any questions, I'd love to try to answer them. <laughs> what is the price? <laughs> uh, Jim says that he sees wild sheep and domestic animals together all the time. Well, that's the area where, where chasm is. Yeah, there are places where there has been lots of contact. There's no doubt about it, and we're living with that, the results of that. But that's very that's sort of the epicenter right now. Well, domestic sheep industry is expanding in in BC as well. No. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, historically, there's been. Thousands and thousands of domestic sheep trailed all through the interior of BC for gold mining purposes. Actually, yeah, Philip Merchant told me last night that he's got a, he's got some archive records of 2,000 sheep being taken up past Tagish and stuff, and it's like, holy cow, how did they do that? That's inc incredible. But did that introduce anything? Kind of interesting. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah. I, I didn't I wasn't specific about it. Mycoplasma ova pneumonia is a very small soft walled soft walled bacteria. It's very light. It's very easily transmis transmitted by aerosols. So if you had it and sneezed in my face, I would get it pretty much for sure. Sharing feed, sharing water, etc are potential ways of transmitting it, but it can't live very long in the environment. 
So it has to be really close contact. So, yeah, if a big horn or a thin horn jumped into your flock and started hanging out with the ewes and the ewes were, were shedding that organism, then they'd, pick, they'd be able to pick it up quite easily. There have been viruses identified in some of the pneumonias as well. Um, uh, viruses like uh, parinfluenza 3, which is primarily a cattle virus, uh, as well as IBR, BRSV. Yes, there are, have been some, but it's not consistent. It's just not a consistent appearance. Not like mycoplasma. So mycoplasma is not a secondary infection? Mycoplasma by itself a bighorn could live with. And, and there are populations in, in the U.S. where mycoplasma is present in the population, and they're doing okay. The bighorns are doing okay. The lambs are surviving. And what we think is happening in those populations is that they've adapted to them. They've been exposed for so long that they've adapted to that particular mycoplasma. If another strain comes in from another contact event, we get a die-off. Does that help? Yeah, okay. How many strains are there? Thousands. Hmm. At least a thousand. So as a producer up here, if you were to implement something about moving towards trying to have safe laws, mm -hmm. um, when I butcher in the fall, it's anywhere from 10 to 15 ounces or something like that, yeah. would it make sense if there was some place to bring the material so that out of my land, if I brought Slaughter checks are a really good way to do it, but that's if that organism is in that tissue, in that lung. It might be even better to get the head and the lung, but that's a really great way to do it. If you want to know what's going in your flock, killing those babies and taking some samples for, for trace minerals, for pathogens... Uh, Mary likes that too. Yeah. Those are the sort of things we're exploring, and and I'll maybe let if there are other questions for Helen first, I'll let people ask those, and she can answer, and then I'll spend fifteen minutes or so talking just a little bit more about what the Yukon approach is. The, the Wait study. a minute, you're supposed to be behind the <laughs> camera, not asking questions. <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around the big picture. The, okay. the, um, the studies that have been done on the hearse where there were die-offs, is it conclusive that the mycoplasma came from domestic sheep, or like could this just be endemic? It's a, that's a super good question. Um, the question is, uh, the die-off investigations and research, was it conclusive that the mycoplasma came from domestic sheep, or could it have come from some of the bighorn sheep? Both. They've done both. They've, they've confirmed both. And it really depends on the history of that particular herd. Um, some of these herds have been in contact with domestic sheep for, for like 100 years. And for those animals, uh, it's very it's complicated in the U.S. I'll give you one example. The Snake River Canyon goes through Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Um, there's a very high-priority bighorn sheep herd in there. It died off terrible die-off um, in the early 2000s it started and it jumped from herd to herd to herd lots of sheep dead terrible amount of angst and stuff millions and millions and millions of dollars were raised the research uh, uh, before they started doing disease research they started transplanting new bighorns in there and the die-off continued because all these new herd animals coming in were from different places including Canada and those animals were naive to what was going on there. Um, as years have progressed, they've learned more and more and more about this mycoplasma. And this is where they're now doing the testing, where they're, they're catching a bighorn ewe once. They're swabbing her and sampling her. Um, if she's negative, she's marked, she's let go, she's recaptured, tested again. If she's positive in either one of those two tests, she's killed or she's taken into captivity. And they believe that this testing and removal program has resulted in herds where they're now getting almost, you know, amazing lamb survival. So it's, I guess the short answer is it's both. 
in BC, we just haven't had that same pattern because the domestic sheep industry is so much smaller. As Jim says, we have small flocks now. We don't have very many big ones that are in contact with wild sheep anyway. Anybody else? Yep. So the, maybe it wasn't the Malobi, maybe it was earlier when you were talking about other things, but when you were talking about the, the lamb die off, um, and you said the, the ewes passed it on, why did they pass on antibiotic er, antibodies? And, or they just so that was the pattern that we saw, and we couldn't explain it. We didn't know why. And the, what's explaining that is that these ewes are carrying mycoplasma in their nasal passages, and they're transmitting it to their own lambs. For some reason, the antibody development is not adequate to protect those lambs. We don't know why. Mm -hmm. But it's an extremely repetitive pattern of when these lambs pick up that mycoplasma, they either die <coughs> right away, very acutely, or they're picked off by a predator. And I, I've, I've, found, I've, been ha I've been presented with coyote-killed carcasses of lambs with pure mycoplasma pneumonias. So there's no sign of hereditary transmission? Or, um, you know, that it can be transferred from mother to daughter genetically? As no, 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 it's, 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 it's just a bacteria. Yeah. It, it doesn't need hereditary transmission yeah. at all, no. But, and and they're, they're fine up until about six, six to eight weeks, and then they start going downhill. Is yep. that due to, like, a passive immunity as lambs? Like, uh, I can't remember. It, it, you up, know what? It's possible that there is some antibody protection from the colostrum for that first six weeks, and then the ewes continue to shed this mycoplasma, and it overwhelms the protection. It's very possible. Has there been much work done on early weaning? Um, good question. For bighorns, not. But for lambs, yes. And the initial study um, done by University of Washington in Idaho, they looked at the, a research station um, domestic sheep flock. They orphaned the lambs at six weeks of age, actually more closer to eight weeks of age, and those lambs were were from mycoplasma positive ewes, and they were negative, and they stayed negative. That was the f year one of the research. Year two of the research, they did the same thing, and those lambs, when they initially tested, some of them were positive at eight weeks. So they think they might have to orphan them sooner. But they also said that particular flock had new introductions into it, just before the trial began, began and they had some nutrition issues as well. So we're, that's a, a really key um, flock management project that we're really interested in is whether orphaning animals, and I don't mean you know killing the ewes, just taking the lambs away at an early age, early weaning, can prevent that transmission. So that's a really good point. Thank you for mentioning that. I forgot to. We think that it's got promise, and that might be a really good tool to use up here it's is to, to do. so yeah for sure yep years ago when you talked about treating uh foot rot when you took the domestic sheep into the root um did you ever see any it's one of the reasons why we were concerned about foot rot and we came up with all kinds of wonderful ways to treat it mostly foot bath foot bath foot bath was crazy, but that's one of the reasons why we did. We were, we never did see any outbreak of it, but yeah, super concerned about that. Yeah. Just to go back to the early weaning, is there any risk to the you to the mom of like mastitis or anything from just stop like eight weeks? Pretty late no, and it really depends on your nutrition too. I mean, if you're pounding the alfalfa to them, she's going to be pumping the milk out. But if you get these lambs onto grain or eating some solid food, they'll they'll wean okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you guys agree with that? Anybody else? Sure. Yeah. 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 Just you know, make sure your creeps out there, and, and I think you could do it. Would you want to cut her water down? No. No, you never nah. cut her water down. You you cut down the protein and yeah. keep, make it carbohydrates, and that will slow down the milk really fast. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll present the paper next year on. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, was it your hand up or that was a bee? Oh, it's a giant bee. <laughs> okay, so if, if, you know, if something occurs to you in the middle of the night, 
I don't know if you're like that, but I am. Um, write it down. I, I'll leave my... Well, I've got it right there that you probably can't read. But if there's anything I can help you with, you can always go through Mary or or to myself. You're my... Like, I have nothing else to do with my life. But I'd be happy to try to link you up to some of the, the greater minds that I work with because I don't know it all. I'm not doing the research, but there is some phenomenal stuff going on. It's really amazing. So I, I think I think this this could have some significance for you. I think you guys are perfectly set up to do something now um, rather than wait for the accident to happen. Thanks, Helen. Very much appreciated, as always. Your your years of experience in, in that uh, specific area, for sure. I think I, I want to um, just highlight a little bit more with respect to where Yukon's coming from with this at this point in time. And I think one of the big advantages, as Helen mentioned, is we have the opportunity to get out ahead of this risk. A uh, question that we had from somebody online was, Really, what is, the, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but sort of what is the situation with respect to domestic and wild sheep health risks in Yukon at this time? And the answer is to this point, we have no indication that there ever has been a die off in wild sheep in Yukon, but it's entirely possible that that could have occurred in the back, back country without being noticed because these populations are quite remote and quite distant. But we have nothing to suggest that it has occurred. We do, given the research that Helen shared and the information that we have out there with respect to the similarities between thinhorn sheep and bighorn sheep and how naive the thinhorn population is from contact with domestic sheep or goats, we have a concern, and the risk assessment that we had done supported that we take a precautionary approach to doing something to ensure that separation would be maintained. All of the uh, principles, I guess, that are behind effective management of the risk in the wild, you know, treatment that Helen's alluded to before, treatment of wild populations is a challenge, and uh, preventing disease in wild populations is a challenge. But we have uh, good indications from recommendations kind of across the board that maintaining separation, effective separation between domestic sheep and goats and maybe camelids, llamas and alpacas, and wild sheep populations is an important thing that we consider as we look at how we manage our domestic populations because it's easier to manage those than it is to manage the wild. The approach that we take as, as sort of Yukon government at this point is really two-pronged and it is support for the two things that we can assist with. One of those is, as Matt alluded to this morning, the opportunity to provide funding support to improve the um, fencing and containment of domestic sheep and goats. And where we talked this morning about, you know, is that fence going to be adequate? Is this going to be adequate or is that going to work to enforce separation? Our approach, and I think what I've recommended, is that everything be done on a farm-by-farm -farm basis, on a case-by-case -case basis. The circumstances and the situations on farms in various different areas throughout the Yukon differ greatly. We had one person in one of our uh, conversations about this talk about how um, a brush fence is more effective and more appropriate in their circumstances than a five-foot page wire fence with electric offset when they don't necessarily have 100% of the year opportunity to have electric capacity. Power. Yeah, that's right. Other situations where the land itself may not support posts, you know, like how, how do you manage that sort of thing? I think what we're prepared to do and what Ag Branch staff are prepared to do is to work with people on a one-to-one -one basis and say we'll work to assist in assessing what the risks are in your areas. There are some areas we, we regard all of Yukon as thinhorn sheep habitat. We know they wander everywhere. The boys in particular out looking for flocks of of females to take on, wander 
pretty much anywhere in the territory. The one instance of confirmed contact was with a domestic flock just outside of Dawson. They wandered into communities. There's one living up on the sod, or the hill across from the sod farm, right on on that quasi permanent basis. They're they're not restricted, so we can't do zonal creation and saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna be hard nosed here and we're gonna be more lenient here because pretty much anywhere in the Yukon, St. Horns can exist and can travel through and can in, encounter that direct nose to nose contact with domestics. And then when they're done determining that they weren't really what they were looking for, they head back to their own herd of origin and we have the possibility of an outbreak there. So we can't work with that zone approach, but what we can do is offer support to individual producers to say, we'll come out and we'll give you some assistance in helping to assess what might improve the separation that you're able to achieve between your flock and wildlife. The second prong of an approach is to support individuals who are interested in testing their flocks. Helen's alluded to the possibility of creating MOVI free flocks. There are a variety of tools. One is, is obviously testing the actual sheep. The other is, as you mentioned, if you're slaughtering, testing heads and lungs. You know, it's, it's awful, it's material that you're not going to be selling so it doesn't have a tremendous value. We can facilitate the collection and testing of that to give you a better picture of what the health status of your flock is with respect to MOVI. And it's, in many ways, better for us than a nasal swab because you're actually getting, we get the chance to cut the head in half and go in deep in those sinuses and, and take multiple swabs and multiple samples in an appropriate manner. So we certainly would support that type of interaction. We um, were often faced with, because the Animal Health Unit is situated in the Department of Environment, we're faced with the issue of concern that this is a divisive issue rather than one that is a common concern. And I think what we've heard largely is that everybody in the Yukon values the thinhorn sheep population. Nobody wants to be responsible for a situation that would occur that would result from transmission of a disease from their domestic animals to, that would significantly damage a wild population. So it's nice if we can can actually work together and cooperative. And it's really actually encouraging to see the turnout that we have here today of people and the diversity of, of the group. Uh, so those opportunities for testing are the other possibility. The third sort of prong of the Yukon government's approach is one that deals with the wild sheep. And part of that is, and, and Jane Harms, who's joined us for part of the afternoon at the back, has really been instrumental in developing and uh, um, supporting the wild sheep testing aspect of what we're involved in. So the working with har those who harvest to ensure that we're getting good samples from wild sheep so that we get a handle on whether there are strains that are present already in that wild population when we don't have any indications that, that they have been um, potentially exposed to domestics. So <coughs> being able to collect that information from the wild, map out, as Helen has done, where those samples are taken from and what the status of that wild population is, is a really critical part of this. The other aspect of dealing with wild sheep is the, the government's approach to confirmed instances of contact with domestics. Uh, we've had, and I think probably the, the girl that's up across from the sod farm is, is the most recent instance where we've had it highlighted to us that there is a wild sheep in potential contact with domestic small ruminants that might be in that area. Folks from the agriculture branch were instrumental in going out and chatting with everybody in the area to make them aware of that and also to indicate that if there was an instance of confirmed contact where a wild um, sheep wandered into contact or direct contact with domestics, that the government will take action on those. The wild sheep that was in contact in the Dawson area previously was killed. That was before my time here and it was before the really the broader awareness of this risk. But what we have in place within the department is um, 
is a plan, if there is confirmed contact, we encourage people to report that. And then through cooperation with the Yukon Wildlife Preserve, if there's an opportunity to live capture a wild animal that has been in contact, that's our first approach, is to do a live capture and then hold and quarantine and test multiple times that wild animal to determine whether transmission has occurred and whether MOVI and other agents are present. In the event that wild or capture in the wild, immobilization and capture isn't practical, and lots of times the terrain won't support that because of where they like to hang out, those animals, if we have confirmed contact, will be lethally removed. So that animal will be shot and it will be tested. So there is a plan in place to, to prevent those individuals from returning to their herd of origin and potentially spreading. That isn't activated really unless we have confirmed um, notation of contact. So it's not, in a, and again, that, that you I think is still out on the, on the cliff across from the sod yes. farm, kept an eye on her. We know that she's persistently been there. We know she's been actually really healthy. One of uh, one individual was concerned because he saw her lying on the side of the hill and was thinking, "Oh my God, she's died!" And now it's yeah. you know it's good. It's good. And he went up and he, he didn't get very far before his wife was sitting down the truck. She said, "I'd never seen a sheep move that fast. Like <laughs> they know when you're coming." And she was up and out of there. So obviously, still very healthy and very vigorous and and not uh, not ill at all. So we do have that that approach at this point in time. Part of it is to deal with instances where we do have to intervene with a wild animal. I'll mention on the side that if an animal is harvested for disease testing or to reduce risk, everything that is of value from that animal is utilized, so the meat is all donated. So these animals would be, while we would want, from the lab perspective, we would want that animal for testing, nothing is wasted and the animal would be uh, used for distribution in the meat program. So we have that, that aspect of the wild and we have the two areas of support for the domestic side to assist farmers if they're interested in moving toward having a disease-free flock and assist them with improving the containment that they currently have to prevent contact. Um, the there has been, and the media in particular, but as well, those who are very concerned with the potential risk to the wild population have pushed quite strongly for a regulatory approach, right? To put something into law, and as Helen says, they haven't moved to a legislated approach in BC, nor have they in um, Alaska at this time, but there's been considerable pressure to actually implement law to prevent contact or to in, you know, the variety of uh, full scope, full range of solutions have been suggested to uh, by various parties. At this point, the only regulatory measure that is in place or will be shortly in place is to make respiratory disease <coughs> in sheep, domestic sheep, goats, and camellids reportable so that we can support an investigation into that in a timely manner. That's not to say that more approaches may not be coming, but that's really where it stands at this point. So I don't have much more to offer. I'm enthusiastic about the opportunity to continue working with the folks in British Columbia. We've been in touch with those in Alaska as well. Their situation is quite a bit different. I will say that they actually have a, a very extensive domestic uh, sheep swabbing program that they've offered. They had pretty limited uptake is my understanding. They didn't have as many people engaged in that as they had hoped. But the results have been encouraging, at least as far as what they've reported so far. And I think even from what you found in your domestic flocks in BC, the number of sheep that are positive for MOI is lower than what's been reported in other areas. So I'm somewhat optimistic that we might in Yukon find similar things, that the flocks here are perhaps less likely to be positive, and we may have a better chance for that marketing opportunity and for that um, overall safety, and it may be worth the risk to test because Alaska's found a lot fewer positives than they thought they would, and BC found fewer positives than I think we would have predicted based on what's been found in Washington and, and the states. So, yeah. So do you, 
like, I don't know if the guys at the Apple Car know that you would want the heads. We, they, we haven't put that out there so far, oh, and I, I actually don't know how many sheep are slaughtered this time of year. I think we're coming right. into the spring, and we're coming into the more active um, season for the both of the abattoirs, and it is something that will add to the messaging as we as we go forward. Because yeah, that's the perfect spot. Yeah, there. I think it's part of pulling together the um, the messaging <clears throat> around the reportable hazard part of things, and part of that too is. We have a we have a fact sheet now on reducing the risk of, of pneumonia in, in thin horn sheep that needs to be modified, and part of the modification is really to focus on some things we can do positively. Frozen is okay. Fresh is better, but fresh. <laughs> do you really? <laughs> yeah. She, yeah, the little guys, they're, they're really interested in the covering ear. their inner ear. Yeah. Uh, for the older ones, you can... You can they We'd open it up and do nasal, yeah. deep yeah. nasal swabs. Yeah, salam. Yeah. So, yeah. Freezing actually preserves things pretty well. It's better... If, if you get it right, right fresh, that's great. If you can't get it right fresh, then frozen is definitely better than rotten. <laughs> well, that's the thing. People often think, you know, you say, oh, we want it fresh. Well, that's not two days later, right? That's like within within a couple of hours, <laughs> it's fresh. So, yeah, again. So testing, if we, if we test now and we come up positive, then what? It's up to you now. Well, right now, I, like, why wouldn't I wait or could I wait to take, take advantage of, like, I would want to get rid of them. But it seems like if I do that right now, it's at my loss. Whereas if I wait until some point in the future, whenever that moves into place, I might get reimbursed something for my economic loss. So what's to, like playing the devil's advocate? Why why wouldn't anyone just wait? And and people can right. There okay. is no regulated approach at this point. This is if you think you'd like to know more, it it um, I guess to some extent the sooner positive animals are eliminated the better probably but they've been positive if they're positive now they've been positive for months a few months six months one way or the other isn't going to make a huge amount of difference particularly if they're well contained so i'm not at this point if we test your sheep and you find positives it's going to say you must uh destroy those Right. That's, like, that remains the farmer's decision. Right. You, you, you know, <coughs> but if you got some positive, could you then say, okay, I'll wait till I can get a couple thousand dollars for them? Or you is could. It like they were already positive before this program came in, so you're showing sure up. No. No, I don't. I don't think that would be the case. If we actually, if we actually implemented this to say, okay, now you suspect respiratory disease. This is a reportable hazard. We go in and we take action on that as a reportable hazard. Right. Once that regulation presumably is passed, you have respiratory disease, or you suspect that you might have. Yeah, and we take action on that. Then uh, you wouldn't be penalized because you had that for a month before something became reportable. Jim. I don't know that before my time. Yeah. I know about that, but that was when it was still that was still the game farm, right? That was when um, Danny still owned it. Yeah. So I I don't know. Yeah. Uh, there's there's been there's been a lot that's happened in the past, and I think you know. That, that's right. We, we can't change well. that. We can't change uh, it. So yeah. let's move we're hopeful forward. that we haven't introduced risks inadvertently. Yeah. But I think oh, we're looking really to go forward. Yeah. So I got one more. Has there there's been testing, right? Hasn't there been some testing of domestic sheep in the territory? We've had an offer out to support. I'm not really talking about individuals who may or <clears throat> numbers that we may have done, because it tends to pinpoint people. Okay. Right. And so really one of the, the things we've committed to is that if somebody comes to us, we will they're free to make it public. They're free to talk about it. But we won't talk about it unless they've said that um, you know, that, that could happen. So positive so, and negative results you won't talk about. No. Okay. No. Wild Last yes. Thing. Wild sheep, yes. I'll talk about positive and negative yeah. that's a public resource and that's public information. Information with respect to one farmers or three farmers' flocks right. is 
protected. So there yeah. may be movie tests in domestic flocks, but you can't tell us. That's no. right. Exactly. So That's right. could anyone, like, how, how are we supposed to solve this discussion, too, if we don't know? We can't, I think, until present. the regulation kicks in. Once it's reportable. Then yeah. yeah. Once, Once it's, it's reportable, it's we, we again try to protect individuals' privacy, right? We have the authority under legislation to share information that is um, related to the activities we, we are involved in for disease control. Typically, we again try to um, protect individuals. I would, once it's reportable, I would strongly encourage individuals who have positives to make that known. Uh, you know, that either you're part of an industry, you're part of a very small network of people, and you're going to be supported through a compensation program and whatever type of decision making you carry out given that information. So I think we would, we would largely encourage people to be um, open about that. Um, I'm not sure if there are specific circumstances. I just think about you know people who might want to buy or are not. Um, again, the system as it exists is buyer beware. The um, verification that you can ask for with respect to what you will spend your money on rests with you. You have the opportunity now to, to say to someone, I will not buy from your flock unless you show me documentation that you have had every animal in that flock tested for MOVI three times and they've been negative. You can, you can do that now. Yeah. What does uh, <coughs> uh, MOV uh, test cost? What does it cost? Yeah, to do a swapping <sighs> Well, it depends what you count in the cost, right? Like what we've done in the past is. I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is, if an individual um, owner wants to do a swap and send in to be um, tested to see if this box is moving through or not, what would that cost that person? So the question is, what would it cost for someone to do a swab and send it into the lab and have it tested? They have to buy a container of swabs, which is probably in the neighborhood of twenty dollars. I think that was about what we what we ranged for, you know, twenty swabs, something like so, about a buck for a swab. But you've got to buy twenty. You have to contact the laboratory and determine their cost for doing the test. The cost from the laboratory directly to a producer is likely to be higher than the cost that they give us as a partner organization, and so. Ours is relatively low, and it might range. Jane, do you know what it was? Yeah, so right now it's about 57 bucks for a... For a single swab. Yeah. Yeah. So it runs about 50 bucks a swab, and recommend retesting three times. So could someone take a swab, bring it into you to kind of test it? Would you facilitate that now? Yeah, we facilitate it. Yeah. 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 We would... Um, I think the, the bigger part of someone taking it themselves which is what we haven't done in the past. What we've done in the past is one of our staff will go out and actually take the swabs because people doing a nasal swab may not go in deep enough, may not go in far enough, may not go into the multiple you know, sort of locations. And, and you, know, you just stick a swab up the nose and go, yeah, okay, I'm good. The chances of getting something are a lot less than if Jane goes out and does it and she's gonna. She's not gonna penetrate the brain, but she's gonna go up as you know, firmly as she can and get a good on swab. So will the, will YTG do that now? Will they go up to your summer request? Will they go up and do a swab for a movie? Or we will try to. Yeah, we're we're short staffed, so it may be there may be time constraints with respect to how we can make that work. In some instances, we may work with private practitioners to get their assistance in uh, collecting the swabs, so we may have them do it on our behalf or with someone from our staff, but we will support that process. And we've got a relationship with the laboratory where we can actually submit the swabs. And you get paid for the part of the veterinary Yes, okay. yeah. And <coughs> we'll, at, we're, we're, I guess it hasn't been clear. In the past, we have not covered the cost of testing. That was excluded from the program. We are being a little bit lenient with that, and we're expecting that we'll actually cover the cost of testing in next fiscal year. So requests that come to us after April 1st from people in the veterinary services program, we will cover the cost of testing. 
in the month and a half coming up, it's not part of technically part of the current program. <laughs> well, you can, you can actually freeze the swabs and hold them for a few months. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys are short, well, I guess if you're going to private practice, then that's fine. But like, what's the point of doing it if you can't come back and do it the three times, or you can't? You do it the oh yeah, you would, we would, there would be a commitment to do the three tests. Okay. Yeah. It's just right now the staff time that we have and the number of individuals we have who can go out. We might not be able to schedule the first one next week. Right. Okay. Yeah. But once you commit to it, then, we'll then you, you'd set it up. You'd go do the first one. You'd come back and do the next one in the appropriate time range. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we've done in the past. But a lot of it, you know, it depends on people's schedules and and uh, uh, the workload we have. That sounds very positive hey. for you guys to add testing because I never understood. Like, I always, you say people never took advantage of it, and Pauline and I are talking, well, we never took advantage of it because we didn't feel the need to have a vet come out because yeah. I don't go to the doctor if I don't have a reason. Yeah. Like, like, he seems like a nice guy, but I got other things to do. So <laughs> same with the vet. Like, I don't, you know, watch, come on, take a look. Like, can't do any preventative stuff for testing, so I think that's a very smart move. Yeah, testing. I think I think it's based on, it may change in future, right? But right now it's based on the fact that we haven't maxed out the use of the program. And so we haven't been spending the dollars allocated within Growing Forward for this program on veterinary services to livestock producers, which is what we really hope to do. And so we thought, well, one of the areas we might increase that amount is by actually covering the costs of testing. Okay? If that's it, I, again, I'm, I welcome people's calls and contact at any time for questions around any of this or anything else. I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer now, and I think we'll wrap up. Thank you, Mary. We are so on schedule. Can you believe it? <laughs> it's fantastic. And wow. we have five minutes to do our evaluation. So can every... Uh.